Each year, millions of us travel abroad in search of sun, sea, and occasionally romance. I was just like, oh my God, I felt myself melt. He was charming, he was attentive, he just made you feel special. But beware, predators lurk in our favorite resorts. Some are expert in breaking hearts. I learned an awful lot about the guy that I thought I'd been going to spend the rest of my life with. And others are experts in running down bank accounts. The money I spent on him, probably 18, 19,000 pounds. We expose the heavy emotional price paid by those tricked and conned by holiday love rats. At that point, he just lashed out and slapped me across the face. And we reveal why you could be their next victim. Anybody can fall for a con game. Good con artists will read the people and they will play to their weaknesses. Stirling in Scotland is home to Alana Longshaw. She's 19 years old and openly admits that until recently she lacked experience in matters of the heart. I'd had relationships before, but I had never loved anyone before. I never knew what love was. I never knew how I would feel. That was until she met Jan. It all began in 2010 Alana was a 16-year-old schoolgirl who regularly visited Turkey with her family. She became part of an internet-based fan group for their favorite resort. I had joined a Marmonist group for everyone that goes on holiday there. The next minute I had a message and it was from him saying hello. We started speaking every single night, every week, every day. At the start, they were just online buddies. But in 2010, a family trip to Marmaris on the southwest coast of Turkey transformed their relationship. Alana was there with her mum and family friend Adrian, but ended up having a surprise encounter. I just remember him walking past. Well, I turned around, that's Jan, and he turned around and spotted you. He kind of had his eyes set on you, as if nothing else mattered. Didn't like the look of him, how he was acting. But Adrian's opinion had little impact on Alana. I'd felt myself melt. I was just like, oh my God. Everything about him was better in person. He was so perfect. There was no one way I could fault him. Soon after her first trip, she persuaded her mother to return to Turkey so she could spend more time with Jan. But holidays were not enough, and lovesick Alana set her heart on moving to Marmaris for good. It wasn't happy at all, but even though she was young, she still had the the opportunity to do whatever she wanted to do, so I had to just go along with that. I spoke to my mum about it and I said, I really need to go. And she still disagreed and I told her, I'm 16, if you don't let me go, I'm just going to go anyway. So Alana had her wish and in 2011, she flew to Turkey to start a new life with her dream boyfriend. Jeanette Sayers also thought she had met her ideal man abroad. She's a 56-year-old beauty consultant from Whitby in Yorkshire but her holiday romance turned out to be even stranger than fiction. Following the death of her husband, Jeanette remained single for seven years. But in 2004, her life would change forever during a holiday with a girlfriend in Sorrento, a small Neapolitan town in southern Italy. We'd planned where we wanted to see. Didn't even think we'd have time to be involved in any holiday romances, either of us. But on her first night out, Jeanette met a handsome stranger in a local bar. He said his name was Rudy Sloot. He came across as a polite gentleman, really. He said that he actually worked with the president in the White House as men in black. He said, I'm an undercover agent. We said, oh, you mean like James Bond? And we both burst out laughing. No, he said, genuinely, that's my job. He then put his charms to work on Jeanette. He asked if it would be OK if he just spent the day with me. At that point, I did really fall for him. He seemed to be such a really lovely man. After their holiday romance, Rudy bombarded Jeanette with texts and phone calls. He said, I think I've fallen in love with you. I'd really like to carry this relationship on and see how things go. He asked if he could pay Jeanette a visit in the UK. She agreed, but he ended up staying. It was like we'd been together for years. I thought this is the relationship I'd love to be in. It was just so lovely. Rudy claimed he was still working for the US Navy, 
from a UK military base. And according to Jeanette, he had the credentials to prove it. There's a badge off his naval uniform and then a badge for his car, supposedly to get into the military base. You really would have thought he was um, someone in the forces. But Jeanette was about to find out it was all too good to be true. In January 2011, at the age of just 16, Alana Longshaw moved to Turkey to be with her dream love, Jan. Wedding bells were soon on the horizon. Instead of getting engagement rings, they had his and hers tattoos. For a while, everything went smoothly, but soon her dreams of marriage began to turn sour. The money was running out, so it started to get more stressful between us. So he started to go out more and leave me in. So he would go out with his friends and then come back. We're not a penny. Towards the end of their time together, Alana says Jan became violent towards her. We were arguing a lot more, and then he started shouting about where I had been and who I was with. And at that point, he just lashed out and slapped me across the face. I was so shocked, I couldn't think what to do. So I tried to grab my passport and run out the room. And he had came after me and grabbed the back of my hair and pulled me back in again. So I knew at that point, everything, everything had changed. Alana claims Jan went on to slap her on another occasion. In August 2011, she decided enough was enough and ended their eight-month relationship to return home to Scotland. As soon as I got through the doors at the airport, I just felt like a huge relief. Jeanette Sayers' dream relationship also took a turn for the worse. First, Rudy talked his way into living with her. He then began asking Jeanette to buy him expensive goods. He just nagged, nagged me into to get in this car for him, so I finally gave in. The car was just over £16,000, which was more than I'd ever paid for one of my own cars. Jeanette went on to spend even more on Rudy, who always promised he would pay her back. She started to have doubts about their relationship, and things came to a head when one night he arrived home drunk. I walked over to the sink in the kitchen and he went, get back here now. And I went, no, I said, put my cup in the sink. And he picked me up like you would pick a child up and plonked me back down on the chair. He said, you don't know what kind of life I've led. And I, that, I started to go all cold inside. I was thinking, what does he mean? At that point, he went off to the bathroom. I picked the phone up and dialed 999. He came back out of the bathroom and seen that I'd grabbed the phone off the wall, and he ran across the kitchen and grabbed the phone off me and said, what have you done? And within about 10 minutes, two police cars turned up. They whispered to me, is there an incident going on here? And they said, just nod or shake your head and I nodded and they asked me to step outside. The next thing I knew they put the handcuffs on him and brought him out of the house and he was looking at me. To this day, I think that look he gave me, if looks could have killed, I would have dropped dead then on the scene. Rudy was placed under arrest and the police later told Jeanette he was a wanted man. They also had another shocking revelation. Not for one minute did I visualise the things that the police came a couple of days later to tell me. Hello, Valerie Bamping. 60-year-old Valerie Bamping is a successful sales manager from Newark in Nottinghamshire. Yeah, but how about Tuesday? Tuesday, because I could be up in your area on Tuesday. She may be a hit in the business world, but it's a different story when it comes to love. I am absolutely disaster with men. For some total reason, I always seem to attract the wrong types. I have no idea why. I always seem to attract the ones who just want a good time rather than the ones who actually want a proper serious relationship. When Valerie went on holiday alone to Marmaris in Turkey in 1999, she found this pattern continued. It was nice. I was getting chatted up by guys that sort of in their 20s, and they are good-looking guys, most of them. It made me feel I was attractive, and there was something, you know, obviously they saw something in me that um, 
you know, made me feel good. Despite the attention, Valerie was not looking for a holiday romance. But then she met a man who would change her mind. I met Ergen Tulak, who actually calls himself Marco. He came across as a very professional man. You know, he took me out for nice meals. Did I find him sexy? Yeah, I suppose it would be, you know, the swathy, dark, good looks. Yeah, to a certain extent, I found him a bit sexy. And he was paying me a lot of attention, which is something that I'd been missing from a relationship. I suppose one thing led to another, and we got to know each other, and we basically started a bit of a holiday romance. Ergun, or Marco, said he was a jeweler, and also claimed he'd worked for the Turkish Special Forces. Valerie thought the relationship was getting serious. She says he gave her a ring, which she took as a sign that marriage was on the cards. He came back with uh, this ring that he claims that he made for me. And, uh, I mean, it, it is 18 karat gold with diamonds and an emerald, but it's not exactly what you would think of as an engagement ring. This is more like a man's ring. Over the next three years, Valerie said she handed over large sums of cash to Marco. That was the motorbike that he persuaded me to buy, 500 pounds. And, oh, it would be our motorbike. Well, we used it once, so I never saw it again. Valerie says she then loaned him £5,000 and that Marco told her he needed the money for a licence so he could carry on trading in gold. He actually sat there on the beach and he cried his eyes out. He said, oh, he says, I'm going to lose everything because I can't afford to renew my gold licence. Carried away with the emotion of the situation, I lent him the money. I was always asking him, when am I get this money, when am I get this money? Oh, well, he said, I've got some business transactions happening. There was always a good excuse and there was always something that was coming and that never did. It was in the third year I was becoming disillusioned with it. The love affair was over, so to speak. Ergen says he never asked Valerie to marry him. He also denies receiving any money from Valerie and instead claims she owes him money Valerie says this isn't true. The couple broke up in 2001 without Valerie receiving back any of the money she said she loaned to Ergen. Valerie also says she later learned he did not own a jewellery shop. Then the wife of Marco's cousin made a shocking revelation. She actually brought me into reality and told me about his wife. I learnt an awful lot about the guy that I thought I'd been to spend the rest of my life with. Our research has revealed Ergen Tulek fathered a child with his Turkish common-law wife during the time he was in a relationship with Valerie. He now has a total of nine children with three different women. Morning. Hi, Jane Cole from Rothwell in Northamptonshire claims she also had a love rat experience which changed her life forever. It all began in 2005, during a dream holiday to Africa. So what you have to say? Not a lot. Just have this and go shopping, then do a bit of packing when I get home. Are you going away? Yeah, Gambia. Oh, wow. The Gambia is in West Africa and is known for its weather, beaches and friendly people. At least you go out there with a brand new hairdo. Yeah, we're recognising <laughs> <laughs> Jane's troubles began during her first trip to the country. She wasn't looking for love, but she was aware the Gambia did have a reputation for holiday romance. In the paper you read that uh, there's women going out there and they're coming back on one plane and the guys are meeting somebody else off the next plane coming in. I thought, well, that wouldn't happen to me because I'm worldly wise. That self-confidence was put to the test during her first night out in the popular resort of Senegambia. When it all went out for me, and then we got our drinks, and Vanessa said, somebody over there keeps looking. What are you? Oh, I said, no, I can't be bothered. You know you like. Well, then he came over and asked me to dance. He called himself Michael. Originally from Nigeria, he was working in a Gambian nightclub. She was 56, he was 28 and Jane found his charms hard to resist. 
He said, do you want a drink? So we had a drink, stopped there all night talking. He was asking where I come from. I think at that time I probably just thought it was just an holiday romance, you know, and I'll come home. And that'd be the last I hear or see of him. It wasn't. And it soon became clear Michael wanted to turn their relationship into more than just a one-night stand. At the hotel, he'd left a note. Hi, come by to see you. Can you give me a call? Here's my number. And then I arranged to go to the beach with him the next day. So he came and picked me up, carried me back. Quite the gentleman. He was charming, he was attentive. Nothing was too much trouble. He just made you feel special. And at the end of the week, I was completely drawn in. So what began as a holiday romance had developed within months into a serious relationship. And eventually, marriage was on the cards. There we go then. But Jane kept her plan secret from the one person she was closest to, her younger sister, Tracy. I knew she'd met somebody, but I knew nothing about him. She was very evasive about, you know, who, who it was or anything. And I knew she was going away to Gambia, and she was going with friends, and I was all whispering. And I said, what's going on? She went, nothing. I said, you're going to let's get married, aren't you? She went, no, no, no. And off she went to Gambia. Then when she came back, she told me she got married. So I just told her what a fool she was, and I wasn't very happy. After they got married in 2006, Michael suddenly announced he wanted to move into Jane's home in the UK rather than live in the Gambia, as they'd planned. I was shocked, and I was a bit gutted, because I thought, I've done all this to start a life in here, and now it's not going to happen. But I've married him, I'm happy with him. If that's what he wants, then so be it. I did think, is he married me for me, or is he married me to get to England? Once they were living in the UK, Jane began to question whether he was being faithful because he often went missing for long periods. When Jane called a UK telephone number, found repeatedly on his mobile phone bill, her suspicions were confirmed. Someone says, well, I'm ringing you up to see why your number's on my husband's phone bill so much. So she said, who's your husband? I said, Michael. She said, Mike was my boyfriend. So I said, but how long, how long have you been with him? She said, six years. So I rung him up and told him to get his bags packed and clear off. And he thought it was funny when he came in. He said, you know, people look at us and laugh when they see me with you. Well, my confidence went down even more. I was absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated. We have made contact with the woman Jane spoke to, and she has confirmed she was in a relationship with Michael during his marriage to Jane. Jeanette Sayers also feels emotionally betrayed. She believed Rudy Sloot worked for the US military intelligence, but after his arrest in 2005, following an incident at her home, the police reveal the truth. He was a sophisticated con man who'd committed a series of previous offenses and was on the run from Interpol. Rudy Sloot was not even his real name. Psychologically, it's been a lot to deal with. Even all these years after, I still can get emotional about it. And I think, you know, um, I don't think I'll ever get over it. It has ruined my trust in people, I have to admit. I'm very, very sceptical when anybody asks for a favour or anything like that. I'm always looking at the other side of it, well, what are you getting out of it? Which is not a nice way to be, because I always used to be a very trusting person. Alana was just 16 when she left Scotland to live with her Turkish boyfriend in Marmaris. At the end of their failed relationship, she returned home to Stirling. But her mother noticed something was different. One day we were out shopping and she said, 
you've put on a lot of weight. She said, just sometimes the way you stand, she said, you, you look like you're pregnant. And I was laughing at her, I thought it was hilarious. I was like, oh, come on, don't be ridiculous. She's now 19, and mum to two-year-old Aydin, whose father is her former Turkish boyfriend, Jan. I knew nothing about babies at all. I'd never even held a baby before. It wasn't the way that I wanted it to be. We weren't together and I was only 17. <laughs> It's really upsetting and disturbing, and I try, I try not to think about it. I would do everything that I could to make sure that he'll never come over here, ever. Three months, Jeanette carried on living in the house they once shared, in constant fear, before deciding to sell up and move out. That was nine years ago. Well, this is where I used to live. And that's the cottage up there in the distance. Um, making me feel a bit shaky. He still had a key to the cottage. And I remember coming home one night from work and the kitchen door had been opened and things had been moved in the kitchen. So instantly I panicked and dialed for the police. And then one of the neighbours said he had actually seen Rudy in the village, so I instantly froze and I felt I had to move. I'm glad I've been and done it. I don't have any fears now of coming and passing through this way. I'm one step near and out. <laughs> getting to my goal of being getting back to 100%. Next, we reveal the disastrous cost of dating a holiday love rat. The money I spent on him, probably 18, 19,000 pound, easily. Valerie Bamping from Newark says she lent large sums to the man from Turkey she thought she was destined to marry. £4,000 from a credit card. And the more she thinks about it... The 5000 for the gold licence. The more she's come to believe Ergen was taking advantage of her. All these crazy stories that he came up with that I actually believed. He had never asked me would I give him the money. It was always, could he borrow this? And I said, well, on top of everything else, oh yes, but I will get you everything back. I will get you everything back. I just need this tied me over. Ergen admits he and Valerie had a good time together, but says any money spent by Valerie was on herself. He also denies withdrawing £4,000 from Valerie's bank account using her credit card. Jeanette Sayers also says she spent thousands of pounds on conman Rudy Sloot. The money probably I spent on him, probably £18,000, £19,000, easily if not more. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Jane Cole, who married love rat Michael on holiday, usually tells her sister Tracy everything. That's quite nice. No? Uh, you better, no. But in 2006, Jane didn't tell her she was spending thousands of pounds on her new husband, including money to help set up a taxi firm in the Gambia. I did think to myself, I've just got a bank loan out for £15,000 for our car. I brought a minibus, three and a half thousand, for the minibus. It was it was just a waste. I thought that's like eighteen and a half thousand pounds gone. It started to come out about what she'd given Michael, the car she'd brought him, the money she'd given him, and all the time I'm getting angrier and angrier and angrier. 
And I'm thinking, God, what have you done? All I kept doing was giving and giving and giving until I had nothing left to give. Valerie Bumping has discovered reports of other British women who met Ergen in Marmaris. In these reports, the women claim they too believed he was unattached and went on to hand him substantial sums of money. Oh, how I became a real-life Shirley Valentine. It is him. Handsome Turkish gentleman. <laughs> yeah, and the rest. Ergun Tulek disputes these reports and claims one of these women is now his business and life partner. His name keeps cropping up on here, it really does. To find out whether she could have any claim on Ergun Tulek, Valerie is meeting Steve Prophet from the UK scam fighting unit Action Fraud. I suppose it's perceived that I willingly gave him the money. So would that be viewed as, well, there's nothing we can do about that? No, it wouldn't. It doesn't matter that you loaned it to him. We can still deal with that. On the money transfers, the money is untraceable. That the second mm. it leaves you and they pick it up, it's gone. There would be no way, I presume, that I could take it any further, would there? You can. You can still report this. But clearly, yeah. if the documentary evidence isn't available, it significantly weakens the case against this individual yeah. in relation to you, mm. but it doesn't preclude a prosecution. Steve Prophet also has a stark warning for unsuspecting holidaymakers at risk of being targeted each year by love rats. Ultimately, they are there for one thing, that's to make money, to get yes. money off you, yes. and they will go to whatever lengths is necessary. Mm -hmm. And of course, once they've got one payment, it, it then becomes more and more and more. Yeah. And the more payments you're making, the easier it becomes for them. And, and then, frankly, it's a gravy train. There's a lot I learned today that I would never have thought possible. I'm never obviously going to get any money back, but I could still use that information to warn other people. It's all really very interesting. Jane Cole knows the emotional cost of a financial meltdown can push people close to the edge. Her mounting debt resulted in her being declared bankrupt in February 2007. He took everything. He took everything from me. Emotionally, he drained me. I was already on Prozac then, and I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't even tell the doctor what was, what was about me, because I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't believe that anybody, a man could treat you like that. I think probably I was scared that she'd probably try and take her own life or something, because she was in such a bad place. I mean, I know she probably wouldn't have done, but that's how low she was. <sighs> she was a wreck. I've never, ever seen my sister like that. And to see her like that made me bad. Do you know what I mean? It made me upset, cos... She's supposed to be the strong one. She's supposed to look after me. The lives of these women have been devastated by their respective holiday love rat experiences. But do they feel they played any part in their own downfall? I do blame myself a little bit for being foolish enough to enter this relationship with him and let it carry on the way it did. I'm annoyed that I fell for it. I'm supposed to be an intelligent person. But on the other hand, I think to myself, chalk it up to life's experience. I never had an inkling that he was seeing another woman. I felt like I was some stupid old woman. You, you degraded, you know. How can you be so stupid as to do what you don't? The only feeling of guilt I have is for Aidan. One day I'll need to tell him, maybe not what happened, but I will have to explain in, in some way why Jan is not here and why things never worked out between us. Jeanette Sayers is still rebuilding her life in Whitby. Hello. Hello. Her new partner, Adrian, is a professional chef. They met nine years ago. So I was at work, and one of the lads there, David, said, he said, there's new last year started. She's really nice. I think you're going to like her. And I was making a cup of tea, and got talking to Jen, and, and that was the start of it. Just over a simple cup of tea at work in the kitchen. But Adrian knew nothing about Jeanette's nightmare foreign romance. I had to tell Adrian about 
what had happened because I didn't want him to find out off someone else. It was like a film script, the way you described it, it was, it was almost like a film script. Yeah. But it didn't sound 100% believable to start with, you know what I mean? Yeah. After being arrested, Rudy Sloot was placed on bail. He then went on the run for three years, but his luck eventually ran out in Cumbria. Everywhere I went, I was always scared I was going to bump into him. And I got a phone call from the detective that had been on the case. And he said, I hope you're sitting down. Uh, he said, you're not going to believe it, but he said he's actually been caught. Jeanette's holiday love rat pleaded guilty to deception and perverting the course of justice. On the 12th of September 2008, he was sentenced to over two years in prison. A year later, his sentence was extended when he was convicted of four further counts of theft and deception. To have new friends and a new life and a new partner, it was a new beginning. Jane Cole has also been through a traumatic experience, but this hasn't put her off returning to the place where her problems all began. I'm packing my suitcase, cos I'm off to the Gambia with some friends. Bit of sunshine. Really looking forward to it. But she's also aware that she could cross paths with Michael in the Gambia, where he was last seen by her sister two years ago. But if I did see him, I'd like to confront him and ask why, why he treated me so bad. How you could do that to somebody. I believed everything he told me. If he'd have told me I ain't got another woman, I would have believed him. If I'd have saw him with another woman and he'd have said, that's, oh, that's a friend, I would have believed him. Jane's experience has had an impact on her ability to trust. <laughs> it's a recurring theme among victims of holiday love rats. Conman Rudy Sloot may have been put behind bars for his crimes against Jeanette, but the emotional damage he'd inflicted put a serious strain on her relationship with her new partner, Adrian. Because I had this trust issue with Adrian, every th time he was late at home, oh, um, he said he was going somewhere. I wanted to know if he, where he was going, when he was going, when he was coming back because I was comparing him to Rudy. I mean, Jen's got violent with me at some points, haven't you? Because the trust issues with things. Um, I mean, I've had scratches on my face from you and, and scratches down my arms and, and all sorts. I did put up with a lot. Um, normally, I'd have probably walked away. Um, but because of what Jen had been through, I made allowances um, and it was hard. I had to go to a therapist and talk it through, just to get it out of my system, basically. And it helped a lot. It did help, yeah. Oh. To come on. Come on, then. Come on. Good girl. <laughs> Alana Longshore is also coming to terms with life after her love rat experience. She came back to Sterling pregnant and has since discovered more about her ex-boyfriend Jan's post-breakup relationships. In July 2013, he appeared in the national news in connection with another young British teenager. I just seen the headline and seen his face, and I just remember thinking, oh my God, what has he done now? In a newspaper interview in summer 2013, Morat Janatani described himself as a bad boy and admitted he can't stay with just one girl for more than a few weeks. I started getting the messages about all the different girls that he was going to meet. I would say, all in all, it was about 15 different women. He would say things like, after Aiden was born, me and my new girlfriend are going to have a baby and it's going to be better than the baby I had with you. It was all messages relating to a new girlfriend all the time. Jeanette Sayers also still bears the psychological scars of her time with the con man she knew as Rudy Sloot. But who was he? I know that he got the name because he'd interviewed a guy for a driving job 
and he took this guy's identity. Rudy also used the name Anthony de Klerk, and while he was on bail for the crimes against Jeanette, he conned other innocent victims. He's gone on to the Lake District area and applied for a job as a chef. He said he'd, he'd stolen £20,000 from the safe and had racked up £21,120 on debit cards. The police caught up with him and he was convicted for these further crimes. Detectives have now revealed his real name is Peter Van Damme, that he was originally from Belgium and that he targeted people right across Europe. Jeanette has travelled to the University of Central Lancashire to meet psychologist Dr Paul Seeger, who is an expert on how con men operate. If somebody kind of met you on a holiday romance and after a couple of days said, oh, can you lend me 16 grand? No way on earth you're, you're ever going to do that. However, if you kind of do it gradually uh, and you do it right, it would be a, a very strong person that resisted. I, I, I can absolutely see uniform, badge like this, a sign of authority. Um, Any time somebody's we perceive to be an authority over us, we are more likely to um, go along with what they're asking of us. I'm going to ask you a slightly odd question. If I was to ask you to rate his attractiveness on a 1 to 10 scale, how would you rate his attractiveness? At the time, of 10. Right. No matter what we might say, we might say, oh, no, it's nothing to do with physical attractiveness. It's about personality, that kind of thing. But um, a number of tests suggest over and over again the thing that we're most persuaded by of physical attractiveness. I feel guilty for bringing him actually into the country and then him going on to scam people out of money. If you'd have kind of rebuffed him, it's not as if he was going to suddenly say, Do you know what, I'll give up my life of con artistry. He would have just moved on to somebody else. According to the Office of National Statistics, more than 1,000 people each year become victims of dating scams. So Jeanette is not alone. It's a relief, obviously, to know that I haven't been as foolish as I think I've been and that I'm not the only one and there is hundreds of people out there that it happens to who never, ever report it. And for me, it's made me feel a lot better about myself. Next, Alana's determination to keep her young son out of the hands of her former lover. I'm hoping Naiden will be able to live a safe life in the UK with no threats of Jan coming over here and taking him from me and that we can just get on with our lives. Jane Cole has finally arrived in the Gambia. For her, it's an idyllic holiday destination that over the years she has grown to love. It's laid back, beautiful weather, nice beaches, just love it, full stop. But she struggled to cope during her very first trip back to the country after her marriage to Michael collapsed. The first time I went out was very difficult, very, very difficult. Emotionally, it was awful because everywhere we went is where I'd been with him. It, it is like confronting memories and it was hard. I thought, do I want to be here? Because there's too many memories here. I just thought, I need to get on with my life and try and move on. The Gambia is well known for holiday romance. But the more Jane uncovers about Michael's past behaviour, the more difficult she's finding it to forgive and forget. He was living with a woman here. She bought him a car. I spoke to the woman after we'd split up. We came here, I came here to a friend's wedding. She said, are you Jane? I said, yeah. She said, I didn't know he was seeing you, Jane. I didn't know that he was married. She said, I did see him with you at the airport once and he told me that uh, he was your tour guide and if I came over and spoke to him he would make out he didn't know who I were and I thought yeah I can believe that because that's the sort of person he was. We've tried to contact Michael to ask him for his response to Jane's allegations but he could not be traced. 
Back in Stirling, teenage mama Lana Longshaw is seeking legal advice. She claims former boyfriend Jan has made threats to take her son Aydin back to Turkey. I'm hoping today with the advice that I'm going to get that shows that I have more rights about Aydin than Jan does, as I am the main carer. I'm hoping Aydin will be able to live a safe life in the UK with no threats of Jan coming over here and taking him from me and that we can just get on with our lives. You haven't come too far today? No, not too far. Just in here. Thanks very much. Solicitor Fraser Tate specialises in family law and Alana is hoping his advice can ease her concerns. He has given threats that he would come here and take Aydin back to Turkey and that I would never see him again. There's two ways he could try and get Aydin legally and illegally. Now, if it's legally, he's going to have to go through the courts. And if it's illegally, he's basically going to have to try and snatch Aydin. And he would be very foolish to try and do that because more than likely he'll be caught. In terms of legally, Aydin's never been in Turkey. So Mr Artani would have to raise a court action in Scotland. From what you've told me, I think it's highly unlikely that a court would consider it's in Aydin's interest to see his father. So in general, how would you say my position was? You're the only parent Aiden has known. You're the main carer for Aiden. He's always stayed with you. He's always stayed in this country. I think it's highly unlikely that uh, Aiden would have to have any contact with his father. Good news for Alana. I feel so relieved that all the doubts in the back of my mind have been answered, that me and Aiden are going to be safe and that there's not really anything Jan can do take Aiden from me or to come here and hurt any of us. I just feel like this is the part where it can all be in the past and that I can move on and just a fresh start and not have to worry about what's going to happen and if I'm going to have my son taken from me. We've made contact with Jan but we've been unable to get any response to questions about his relationship with Alana. Give me the butter, please. And how much garlic do we normally put in? That and a bit more. Back in Whitby, Jeanette and her fiance, Adrian, are now in a good place in their relationship despite the fallout from her time with the con man she knew as Rudy Sloot. I think we're nicely now setting our ways, I would put it. Um, Some people call it getting old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he said, it's like getting old, but yeah. we, we, it's drawn us together, really, really drawn us together. They've now been engaged for eight years, but Adrian hopes that one day, Jeanette will finally agree to be his wife. I'm just uh, taking it slowly yeah, so I know that. I can get to know him properly before I make any big, <laughs> more big decisions. Yeah, I'm just rushing away from me. <laughs> Maybe one day. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Jeanette is just one amongst an army of people targeted each year by holiday love rats. Many victims choose to suffer in silence, too afraid to speak out. When I think about Marco now, it's just contempt that I feel for him. He's such an arrogant sort of person. Just think, he's pathetic. He's a pathetic man who thought he was better than everybody else. Make sure Aiden has everything he needs and just be a, a role model for him and show him the right way so he never ends up in a horrible situation or ends up a horrible person like his dad is. I suppose it makes you a bit wiser when something like that happens to you. You try, you think, well, it ain't never going to happen again. Hopefully it won't. I'm not the soft touch I used to be. And I don't think I will ever let anybody get the better of me like that again. Thousands of women travel abroad every year looking for sun, sea and romance. I thought he was one of the most beautiful men I'd ever seen in my life. Charismatic, he was charming. I was attracted to his humour and his friendliness, but I was still very cautious that it's just a holiday romance. 
Some of the men they meet spark instant attraction. He was absolutely devastatingly handsome, I must admit. But sometimes holiday relationships don't last. I felt neglected, I felt suspicious that he's cheating. And the man of your dreams can become your worst nightmare. I got an email from this woman telling me that they were married. These women have been left brokenhearted by accusations of bigamy. He had married a new wife. I could not believe it. And have to fight for justice against the man they thought they knew. He needs to be in prison. In southeast England, music promoter Kim is watching her wedding video with friend Nicola. This is what they call the marriage celebration in Senegal. She married 44-year-old Lai So during a holiday in Senegal in 2007 when she was 50. I didn't get a cake, I got a goat that was sacrificed for me. <laughs> when Kim was introduced to musician Lai in the UK earlier that year, her attraction to him was instant. I thought he was one of the most beautiful men I'd ever seen in my life. Charismatic, he was charming. He said that he was a widower with three children. And so I shared with him very early on that I too had lost two children. I was carrying twins, I lost them. After sharing their most intimate secrets, Kim began to dream of a new life with Lai and his children. We talked about the children all the time. I began to have dreams of us all being together as a happy family. Lai was soon pressing Kim for a permanent commitment. Marriage was talked about quite early in the relationship. He said to me almost every day how much he loved me. So looking back, you think this was genuine at the time? Or... <laughs> I thought it was 100% genuine. And even now, looking at the video, I can't see it. Years after her wedding, Kim says she was told Lai may have been hiding a huge secret. Family members later on were to tell me that he was already married. And after all, surely I knew he was already married. Kim's nightmare at the hands of a man she now suspects of bigamy was just beginning. Personal assistant Dee was on holiday in Suze, Tunisia, in the year 2000, recovering from the breakdown of her previous marriage. I was really distraught. And my cousin Cynthia said, let's go on holiday to Tunisia just to have a break. While relaxing in the port, she met a dashing student called Ahmed. I've actually got two photos here of when Ahmed and I first met. He was absolutely devastatingly handsome, I must admit. He was very charming and he was tall as well. When you get a compliment or someone takes an interest in you when you're in this vulnerable place, you don't sort of think they're trying to scam you. Dee stayed in contact with Ahmed after returning to her home in Bedfordshire and their affection for one another grew into a relationship. I thought, you know, we suited each other. He did make me laugh. I found him quite funny at times and he liked my cooking. After several holidays to visit Ahmed in Sousse, mm -hmm. Dee married him in a Tunisian civil ceremony in 2003. This is us, the night of the party. The party was kept on the roof of a house. It's me and him. It looked like sort of Beckham and Posh there. <laughs> I don't laugh, joke, joke. I thought these were happy days, happy times. After their marriage, Ahmed moved to the UK and worked as a hospital porter. Dee decided to invest in a property in Tunisia. We built a really, really nice house. And um, he'd actually taken a lot of stuff from the house in um, England to put in that house. In July 2009, Ahmed was loading up the car to furnish their Tunisian home and also to visit his sick father. This is the lay-by where Ahmed pulled into on the morning when he left to go to Tunisia. The car was laden and he couldn't go up the hill again. So he phoned me at home and asked me to um, bring his wedding ring 
I came down here with the wedding ring to give to Ahmed, not knowing that Ahmed was going to use the ring for his marriage 11 days later to a Tunisian woman. Ahmed's father died, so Ahmed extended his stay in Tunisia. But in August, Dee received a devastating email from his cousin. I um, had uh, an email to ask me if I've divorced Ahmed. I said, no, what are you talking about? We're still living together. The email was enough for Dee to do further research via a friend in Tunisia. Her worst fears were soon confirmed. I found out that he had married a new wife. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. But bigger battles with Ahmed lay ahead for Dee. In Bournemouth, care worker Julie is reminiscing with her friend Ben about her 2007 holiday to the Gambia, West Africa. Why did you start to like him? Mean... He was a gentleman, wasn't he? He carried all my bags, my water. During her holiday, Julie, who was 45 at the time, met 30-year-old Lamin. He was very physically attractive, athletic. I thought very handsome. I was attracted to his humor and his friendliness, but I was still very cautious that it's just a holiday romance. After three failed marriages, Julie admits she was susceptible to Lamin's charm. I was quite vulnerable, I was getting old. He made me feel like I was unique. Julie returned to Bournemouth, but Lamin remained in contact. I thought, maybe this is the man for me for the rest of my life. And I thought, and I can improve his life and his situation. 12 months later, in November 2008, Julie booked another holiday to marry Lamin in a Gambian registry office. It wasn't the wedding Julie had hoped for. Before the wedding, the woman said, have you got a dress? I said, yes, I have. Why? She opened a filing cabinet and she said, I've got a dress here, rent a dress, one size fits all. I said, you're kidding me. And there's people in a queue waiting to get married after you. Julian Lamin tied the knot, but their romance didn't last long. We spent the whole of our honeymoon filling visa forms in. The whole honeymoon was destroyed. That little nagging thing in my head that was saying, are you doing the right thing or not? I wish I'd listened to it now. Lamin came to the UK in 2008 and told Julie he'd find work as a builder but his efforts at assembling Julie's shed cast some doubt on his construction qualifications. He said he'd build it, but it's not right. It's upside down, partly. There's gaps here. That's hanging off. The roof is just rotting. The window's not right and hanging off, and all the floor's not done. What a mess. Just a bit like our relationship was. It's a memento of what I married and what I've been left with. As they tried to build a life together in the UK, it wasn't just Lamin's DIY skills that left Julie disappointed. He's going out with his friends, drinking. I felt neglected. I felt suspicious that he's cheating. Coming up, Julie deals with revelations about Lamin. She told me that they were married. My marriage might not have been legal. And in America, widow Linda is caught in a web of deceit. He said, everything I've told you for the last year has been a lie. But he says, but now I'm going to tell you the truth. The growing crime known as romance fraud is a global concern. In Goliad, Texas, 66-year-old Linda's story began in 2011 when Larry, her husband of 21 years, passed away. He was my soulmate. We thought we'd just grow old and die together, but it didn't happen that way. He wanted me to move on with my life, and he said, 
I want you to meet a really Christian good man and, and remarry. To help her get over her loss, Linda's daughters suggested internet dating. By July 2012, she found herself in an online relationship with a 56-year-old man called Steve Charway. He ticked all the right boxes for a vulnerable widow. He was gentle, he was kind and caring, and he tells me, far in distance, but near in heart, you'll always be my angel to my heart. He made me feel a little young again. I think she was very naive to the internet. Her and her husband had been together for so long. When she lost him, she, she lost a lot. Steve told Linda that he worked in investments and was often based in Ghana, West Africa. He could explain everything away. He always was able to make you feel like it was okay, and he just had a way. He, he just knew how to do it. It wasn't long before Steve offered a long-term commitment to end Linda's loneliness. He had asked me to be his wife, and we were going to be married. I decided I was going to go to Ghana. We would be married there, and then we would come back here. By this stage of the relationship, Linda had also been providing Steve with money and gifts, sometimes at his request, occasionally at her discretion. This is the uh, money that I actually sent to Steve, and uh, these were for hotel bills, food, medicines, different things that he would say that he needed. As her trip to Ghana for her wedding approached in July 2013, Linda was thrilled at the opportunity to restart her life. I just couldn't wait. We were talking about when we got to the airport, I was just going to wrap my arms around him and wrap my legs around him and kiss him and kiss him and kiss him. But on arrival at the Ghanaian airport, Linda was greeted by an unfamiliar face calling her name. Someone said, Linda. And I looked around, and it was a young black man in a suit and tie, dressed, dressed very nicely. And I walked over to him, and I said, who are you? And he said, I'm pastor. Well, Steve had talked about pastor. In fact, the pastor was going to marry us. He, he said, Steve sent me to pick you up. He's at the church working. Linda traveled to the hotel with the pastor, where she was expecting to meet Steve. But as she waited, she learned the shocking truth. I was starting to be very upset. And I said, he's not coming, is he? And he kind of dropped his head and he said, Linda, do you love Steve? And I said, yes, I must, or I wouldn't have come halfway around the world. He handed me a little church bulletin and it said, Pastor Steve Chairway. And then he said, I'm Steve. I fell apart, totally fell apart. I mean, he said, I'm still the same man inside, even though my skin is black. And he said, everything I've told you for the last year has been a lie. But now I'm going to tell you the truth. I truly love you, and I want us to be married. The picture Linda was originally sent was of an unknown man. We've been unable to identify or trace him, but there is no suggestion he was in any way aware that his photograph was being used by Steve. This photograph also appears on a lot of other websites. The way Steve used his charm to win Linda around is typical of the men we are featuring in this program. Each victim has a story to tell on just how charismatic their ex-partners could be. We must go to some sort of charm school to learn all the things that would make somebody who has a very low self-esteem feel really, really good about themselves. He was compassionate and kind and gentle and he started telling me how much he loved me, and he would tell me how much God loved me, and he, he would say, you're in my prayers. When I met Lamin, he promised me that he'd be there till the end of my days. I'd look after you, he said. He really made me feel age wasn't a factor and that he was a serious man and that what he was looking for was a life partner with somebody who could be the mother to his children. Kim believed she was living a happy and monogamous life with Lai So for five years, until in January 2013, when things began to unravel. 
musician Lai, then 49, was in Senegal making preparations for his children to move to the UK, into a house Kim had bought for them all to live in. Suddenly I get this phone call. I've lost my credit cards. I can't pay the school fees. I need some money. So I sent over all the money that I had at that time on me. Around this time, Kim noticed Lai had removed his property from her house. He had taken all of his smart suits, winter clothes, etc. And suddenly I realized he had gone. Kim used social media to notify her friends and contacts of Lai's unexpected departure. This is when all hell broke loose. Suddenly I had loads of women contacting me. Kim was inundated with women making claims about Lai. She says she was sent photos of one of the women she was being told Lai was married to. Suddenly I was being sent pictures of his wife in the house, pictures of the children cuddled up on the wife. Kim was receiving repeated allegations about her husband. I still to this day don't know how many children he's got. I'd learnt about five wives. I could not move. I was rigid in trauma. As the allegations came thick and fast, Kim didn't know what to believe. She struggled to cope and the toll on her led to a near fatal accident. I actually drank a bottle of vodka staggered up the stairs and I ended up falling down there. And I still to this day don't know how I didn't kill myself. And actually I didn't even care whether I lived or died at that point. Care worker Julie married Lamin Sidibe after a whirlwind romance that began on holiday in the Gambia in 2007 when she was 45. When 31-year-old Lamin had his visa confirmed 18 months later, he moved to the UK and eventually found work at a Bournemouth fish and chip shop. But Julie says the money he earned wasn't spent on going out with her. He'd be coming in about two, three in the morning. I'd be worried. And he'd say, stop phoning me. He said, but I'm worried, you're my husband. You know, and I have a right to know where you are. Two months after being given official permission to stay in the UK in March 2010, Lamin left the marital home. He came home with a bunch of flowers and said, I'm leaving. I said, pack your bags now. Weeks later, Julie says she was contacted by another Englishwoman who made a sensational claim about Lamin. My marriage might not have been legal. She told me that they were married. She said, I tried to get him a visa so many times, it was refused. So he hit the jackpot with me because I had a house, a job, I could afford to keep him. We have tried to contact the woman who claimed to be married to Lamin, but she did not respond to our request. Julie remains unsure if this allegation made in the phone call was true. But her nightmare with Lamin is not over. He still lives in Bournemouth. I hate it when I bump into him and I see that he's just getting on with life. Julie now wonders about the real reason Lamin entered a relationship with her. The only thing he came for was a visa, passport, have a better life than he had there. It was his escape. But he's got what he wanted, and it wasn't me. Dee met her ex-husband Ahmed on holiday in Sousse, Tunisia. In 2009, she was left devastated when she discovered that 34-year-old Ahmed had divorced her and remarried without her knowledge. I phoned him and I said, Ahmed, I've been hearing rumours that you've divorced me behind my back and you've remarried. And he said, um, you, yes, yes, me and my new wife were very happy better do not give me troubles because it is not good for you or for me. Before he left, Ahmed had asked Dee to lend him £36,000 to buy a car while he was over in Tunisia. What he had told me was that he was buying like a Jeep in Egypt and he can bring it back to Tunisia, sell it for double the amount, and then he'd be able to give me back the money. 
With her bank account emptied and her husband thousands of miles away, Dee was left in a state of shock. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. My, my heart was sort of just racing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I didn't crumble. I'm still strong and will continue to be until I get satisfaction. That's all I can say. Dee decided she wasn't going to be beaten by Ahmed and began to fight back. Via a Tunisian lawyer, she found evidence that Ahmed had falsified her divorce papers. He'd sent the divorce papers to a false address in Wembley and the Tunisian court would not accept this. So he had to concoct a story to say I was um, living in Tunisia and he served the divorce papers there. Ahmed was able to convince a Tunisian solicitor to sign off on his illegal divorce papers. Dee was able to track the solicitor down in September 2010. They admitted to signing the divorce papers. This confession uh, was a turning point for me, to be able to get Ahmed to trial. She said she spoke to a lady with an English sounding voice in London. So obviously Ahmed had got someone to impersonate me. Dee was able to prove in Tunisian court that Ahmed had divorced her illegally and that he'd taken thousands of pounds from her by deception. After Ahmed failed in his appeal to the court, they issued a stern punishment. In April 2014, the Tunisian court, in their wisdom, realised that their original suspended three-year sentence was too, too lenient. So they've converted it to a prison sentence for three years. By the time Ahmed's appeal had been overturned, he'd already returned to the UK. Dee now believes he's evading Tunisian jail by living in Cambridge. If he touches down in Tunisia, they will arrest him. But what will the British police do here? Because basically, I want the man arrested for the crimes he's committed In 2013, music promoter Kim was preparing her home in the UK for her Senegalese partner, Lai, and his children. Yes, these were the beds for the first two children to use. Pretty sad. But after she received social media messages suggesting Lai may have had multiple relationships and even marriages, she hit her lowest ebb. My children had gone, my husband had gone. I lost everything so quickly. Having drunk a bottle of vodka and fallen down the stairs, Kim was rescued after neighbours alerted the emergency services. The only thing I could say to the paramedics was no, 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 no. It was all too much to, to take on board. How come I haven't seen what was going on? But the nightmare at the hands of a man she fears may be a bigamist is far from over for Kim. Kim now suspects that the end game all along was for Lai to get her rental property. He sued me for divorce on the grounds of my unreasonable behavior and uh, put charges on my property so that I wasn't able to sell the property. He's trying to evict the tenants. He's trying to take my uh, money through the divorce procedure. He thinks that he can take my assets away from me. Coming up, Kim's hunt for evidence of bigamy. We have it quite clearly said on camera, my wife, my wife. And Linda hopes US justice can catch up with Steve. What do you think the chances are of him being caught and me getting my money back? Kim is fighting to keep her property out of the hands of her love rat husband, Lai. Kim believes if she can find evidence he committed bigamy, then Lai won't be able to make claims on her house. 
Kim has been sent a video by a former associate of Lies, which we are unable to show for legal reasons. I have a lovely wife, and she's beautiful, and she loves me a thousand percent. I've heard those words so many times. Tonight, Kim is watching the video, which was shot in 2003 for the first time. Only my wife understands me. How many times have I heard that? It shows Lai repeatedly referring to another woman as his wife four years before he was married to Kim. Now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the real person. Charming, good looking, smooth talking. I've heard all those words before. They've been said to me. Seeing the video has stirred up some strong emotions for Kim, who hopes it is evidence that helps prove Lai's bigamy. What a total utter. I am so angry. I am so... I have words. I have no words. I am so angry. <clears throat> he needs to be in prison. I hope it's the smoking gun that we need. This will be handed to the police. We have it quite clearly said on camera. My wife, my wife. American Linda was on holiday in Ghana in July 2013 to meet the man of her dreams, 47-year-old Steve Charway. But it turned out the man 66-year-old Linda had been sending thousands of dollars to wasn't the middle-aged white man she'd seen online, but a young black man. I looked in his eyes and he said, I'm the same person. I'm just, my skin color is black, but I'm the same person inside. The shock left Linda reeling. It was horrible. I was blown completely apart. My heart was broken. It hurt really bad. So I told him, I said, Steve, I, I can't marry you right now. I said, I, I need to get a ticket and go home. Linda booked on the next available flight home. But in the time waiting for her flight, Steve was able to show that the man she'd fallen in love with online was every bit as charming in the flesh. I had to wait four days. Well, during that time, he was very, very sweet and gentle and kind and good. And I was falling more in love with him, actually. And I began to regret the fact that I had changed my ticket to come home. Once she'd returned home, Linda couldn't stop thinking about Steve. I knew that I still cared for him, I still loved him, and I guess I was really mixed up. He was begging me and he was saying, why won't you marry me, why won't you come back? Linda relented and booked another holiday to Ghana in October 2013. But days before she was due to fly, she made a shocking discovery. On his Facebook, this uh, woman had written a message to him telling him, you already know how much I love you and soon the whole world will know. And that's how I found out that there was another woman. Linda's daughter found evidence that Steve was in regular contact with the other woman. My daughter discovered this woman had, on her Facebook, had all these pictures of him and everything and confessing all her love for him and all. Linda canceled her holiday to Ghana. She believes Steve has since married the other woman and is now living in the UK. I never heard from him again and then I got an email from this woman telling me that they were married. So I was crushed. I mean, I was really crushed. After investing thousands of dollars in the relationship, Linda felt great shame that she'd been duped. She was offered no support from some of her neighbors in Texas. Some of my neighbors were not very happy with the fact that I had gone the first time and they were making some negative comments to me, but it made me feel like that I, I couldn't share my experience and I was suffering. I felt like I'd done something horribly wrong. I felt like I had let my husband down, Larry. I couldn't face people. The suffering and doubt that holiday love rats leave behind is something all of our women have struggled with. Those feelings have come on. How did I fall for this? I've been taken for an idiot. But it can happen to anybody. I lost all faith in myself. I lost faith in my judgments. 
I even thought about ending it all. This would be a simple way of getting uh, out of this situation. It would take a very special man for me to trust again, but it would be a man that would understand where I'm coming from, um, that I've been hurt emotionally, financially, in every way. I doubt I'll ever have a relationship because of this, because as soon as I meet somebody, I start to question, is it real? I have absolutely no trust of anybody anymore. Julie's 33-year-old ex-husband, Lamin, left her just a few months after his UK visa arrived in 2010. But although he left Julie, Lamin never left Bournemouth, and now even trips to the local shop are emotionally demanding for Julie. Every time I see dreadlocks, I double take just in case it's him. I saw Lamin at the petrol station the other day, did not acknowledge me, drove off. I saw him at Bournemouth Hospital many times when he just totally blanked me. If I had the chance to speak to him, I would say, you are one horrible, nasty, cold-hearted user. Makes me feel really angry. Wherever she goes, Julie is wary Lamin could be nearby, and every street is paved with memories. Toby Carberry, we used to like going there. That's where the Upside Down Shed came from. It's horrible living in the same town as him because you never know where you're going to go, where you're going to bump into him. I went past there one day and I saw him outside there chatting up a girl, a blonde. He's just um, living the dream. As she struggles to put the relationship behind her, care worker Julie is being treated for depression. When it comes to my love life, I'm rubbish. When people tell me, don't do this, don't do that, Julie, you're making a mistake, I'm just like, oh, shut up, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm a bit stubborn. And I thought, with lambing, I'll prove everybody wrong and it's going to work. But I regret it big time now. I feel stupid. I want some kind of closure, I guess. After her ex-husband Ahmed was sentenced to three years' imprisonment in Tunisia, Dee thought he'd be deported. But unless the British police arrest Ahmed following an extradition request from Tunisia, he will remain living in the UK and evading Tunisian jail. Dee's sense of injustice has led her to set up a campaign and support group. Setting up immigration marriage fraud has given me a new focus and a new channel not only to help people, but to work off my stress. And I find you get satisfaction in people feeding back to you and say, thank you, I didn't know that there was such an organisation like yours. Dee is also campaigning for the government to help people involved in immigration marriage fraud. Many of these fraudsters are just laughing at the British people because our loopholes are there. They know what they call the long game and they will wait. And as soon as they get their visas, some of them within even one day of getting their visas will walk away from the marriage. Dee believes she is providing a vital service. These people are just devastated, really, as we all have been. And the good thing is that they're able to identify with you because you've been through a similar process. We have sent all Dee's allegations to Ahmed, but he has not responded. As Dee seeks changes in the UK law, American Linda Austin is hoping United States justice can catch up with Steve Charway. Today, she's visiting Sergeant Poppy in the Goliad Sheriff's Office to find out if anything can be done to recover her money. At, at this point, the case has been presented to the district attorney's office. You know, typically when we recommend an indictment, you know, they will do that. Um, once the indictment occurs, a warrant will be issued. Uh, then the difficult part begins yes. because um, he is in another country. We're actually not sure which country. Is he in Ghana? Is he in the UK? Is he elsewhere? But at least we're at the point now where criminal charges are being brought in the United States. Okay. Um, 
and from there, it, it's going to be a bit of a search, but we're hopeful. What do you think the chances are of him being caught? And if so, what would the chances be of me getting my money back? The apprehension is going to be the more difficult part. As far as getting your money back, uh, that would be part of the sentencing process. One of the options that the judge has is to require that person to make restitution for the amount that you've lost. Complaints like this are an increasing problem for Sergeant Poppy and his team. Even in a small community like Goliad, this is emerging as a greater and greater problem all the time. I probably receive two or three incidents like this per week. With Sergeant Poppy on the case, Linda is feeling confident that United States justice will ultimately catch up with Steve. Steve wanted to come to the US, so I guess now he's gonna get to, but he may not like his hotel. It really is bad to have this going on and to have the feeling of helplessness that nobody cares. So I'm very happily surprised that this is all fixing to come about. Coming up, Linda finally tells all to a friend. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. And that's why I've been out of sight from everybody. I was ashamed. And Kim faces a legal battle with Lai. You stick with that one. Mm. Because that one can be the killer punch that ends the case. Julie has struggled emotionally since ex-husband Lamin left her weeks after his UK visa was confirmed. She is visiting leading psychologist Emma Kenny to try to come to terms with the anger and sadness Lamin has left behind. How are your feelings now? The way he treated you? I hate him. I hate him with a vengeance. In some way, he's taught you a valuable lesson, which is that you're not going to be used anymore. Yeah, yeah, he's taught me that. But um, I wouldn't have liked to learn it that way. And what is it for you that makes you think that he selected you. And some of a very kind kind of person. It's like I've got I listen or like mug written on my head. Oh, I care. I care, yeah. But when it gets thrown back in your face, that's a hard one to deal with. I wouldn't let anyone move in on me again. No way. I'm wondering whether it's more about learning to trust yourself your choices and your understanding and gut instinct, as opposed to feeling like you can't have another relationship or move somebody into your world, which essentially means that Lamin's won. What has he taught you? Not to rush into anything. You know, listening to that gut nagging feeling in your head, those doubts, just to think a bit more about what the consequences can be. Sure. After. Emma's insight has struck a chord with Julie, who thinks her job had a big impact on her decision to enter a relationship with Lamin. For many years now, I've been in support work, supporting people with drug and alcohol issues, mental health issues, and I find it rewarding to help people. So maybe it was a bit of a project that I could help this man out of poverty and help improve his life. We have put all Julie's allegations to Lamin, but his reply was unsuitable for broadcast. Kim thinks she may be married to a bigamist who is attempting to claim her property via the divorce courts. As yet unable to prove social media claims of bigamy, Kim has travelled to Huddersfield to seek advice from family solicitor Jonathan James. I'm hoping that he's going to be able to give his expert eye as to which way we should be attacking this. If Kim can prove musician Lai married her bigamously, she will not have to go through a complicated divorce battle. We try to keep it as simple as we possibly can. So what I'm looking for in any particular case of this nature is, can I show on the documents there was a valid previous marriage? If you can show that, even out of a set of four other potential mm. marriages, you stick with that one, mm. 
because that one can be the killer punch that ends the case. Yeah. Otherwise, you're dragged into the whole uh, divorce finance swamp. Mm. And believe me, it's a swamp. I know. It's about dividing up what there is. It's about money. At the moment, it's all a bit of a mess, and people in our situation are stuck. Yes. It's complicated. It's drawn out. Mm. And because a lot of it is in your hands as a private mm. individual, the risk is that it gets really very expensive. Yes. Kim needs to find more hard evidence of the claims of bigamy. Until then, her case is set to remain ongoing. Kim has some hard decisions to take. Nobody enjoys having a courtroom fight, and she's going to have to weigh up the cost of doing that and whether she uh, grits her teeth, swallows her pride, and decides to keep as much money as she can and pay him something to get rid. And that really will go against the grain. Kim is willing to be patient in her battle with lie. It's just a waiting game at the moment to see what paper evidence that we can get together. But I won't stop until we've actually got some resolution. We have contacted Lai, but he has not responded to Kim's allegations. In Texas, Linda has become a recluse due to the embarrassment of being scammed by Ghanaian Steve Charway after her husband Larry passed away. She is meeting close friend Dolores at her local church to tell her for the first time the extent of the scam she was involved in. As you know, I went to Ghana and I was scammed. You know that much. I talked to this man for over a year and I loved him and then he took off with another woman. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. And that's why I've been out of sight from everybody. I was ashamed. And it just, it hurt. So, so everything he told you was a lie? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I was lonely. I just needed somebody to love me. I see how something like this could happen yeah. very easily. Even though you and I both knew our husbands were not going to be with us much longer, you think you're prepared, but the rug yeah. just comes out from under you. I'm very happy that I know the truth. And if you need someone to talk to, I know. You're a good friend. And so are you. It's been difficult for Linda to tell her story, but it's the first step to moving on with her life. Steve Charway admits to having an affair with Linda, but says there was a second man who disappeared just before Linda's arrival in Ghana. Steve says he gave $800 of Linda's money to his church. As they all attempt to rebuild their lives, each woman has come to their own conclusion about the overseas charmer they fell for. I don't believe my husband ever loved me for a moment. He loved what I could provide for him. I was a means to an end. I was an opportunity. I was a target. I don't cry about Lemmin anymore. I feel I'm not going to let that happen to me ever again. What has happened to me has made me very strong because many women I know in this position, they just want to sort of curl up and sort of just forget things, but no, not me. They don't love you, they don't care about you. All they care about is getting that money. I just wish my husband was back. If he was here, none of this would have ever happened. Next time on Holiday Love Rats Exposed, we meet women who paid for their partners to come to their country. It just was a whirlwind, and I was just so smitten with him. Only for them to leave soon after their visas were confirmed. I would have never dreamed my life would have taken such a turn by making that decision on that day. Leaving the women wondering if they were victims of a scam. It's a description of how to apply for citizenship without having to be in a marriage any longer. He'd done everything he needed to do, and he was ready to get his citizenship. Thousands of women go on holiday every year, looking for sun, sea, and sometimes romance. A 
A growing number even marry a man they've met abroad. As soon as I saw him, I just fell in love with him. It just was a whirlwind, and I was just so smitten with him. And then spend months getting them a visa. It took me about 14 months to get him into the country. They spend a fortune on their new partners. I was pretty horrified when he arrived with one suitcase. I thought, wow, he, he's expecting me to just buy him a whole wardrobe of clothes. But then discover they may not be the only woman in their new man's life. This is the actual email that he was sending out to hundreds of women. And shortly after their new husband's visas arrived, each of the four women in this documentary were left wondering if they were the victims of a scam. He received his British passport on the 5th of December. By the 31st of December, he was booking tickets for Egypt Air to get out of there. Drum teacher Diane from Staffordshire has a passion for African music. Drumming is very important to me because when I'm drumming, I don't think about anything else at all. In 2009, her love of drumming took her on holiday to the Gambia in West Africa. I'd been playing and learning West African percussion for several years, and a group of us went to Gambia to spend two weeks there to study with authentic Jemba Folas, which is drum masters from Guinea. I'd never seen drums played the way they played them, and the sound was just amazing. So to be in Africa and to see and hear that and experience that was, was just beautiful. Then, aged 53, Diane had been single for five months but wasn't interested in romance. Love and relationships was the last thing on my mind. I was focusing totally on the music, experiencing a new and exciting culture, learning about that. One, two, three, four. But everything changed when Diane crossed paths with drum master Mo Bear. We'd had a beach party one night, all the students and the musicians, and um, he approached me from behind and he touched the small of my back. I didn't know who it was, but I remember turning around and being surprised to see that it was him, because it was strangely emotional. The attraction was the music, I think, meeting somebody so talented in such a different way. <laughs> When anybody's abroad, I think you sort of enter a different type of personality, if you like. It's, it's different, isn't it? I was on my own. I had no family. I had no ties with me. So I, was, I felt very independent and very free, yeah. After that first trip, Diane and Mobert embarked on a long-distance love affair. If I thought practically this is likely not to work, I could have said no. But love is like an addiction. I need it to be with him. I want it to be with him. And when I wasn't with him, it was difficult and I missed him incredibly. So that to me is what love is. I needed to be with him. Diane was hooked, but the journey she was beginning was to prove both expensive and heartbreaking. In Norfolk, 49-year-old Michelle also thought she'd found an ideal man while she was abroad. That's a nice one of him, actually. It was 2005. Michelle was 40 and working in the Middle Eastern city of Dubai when she met Egyptian deep-sea diver Walid. I went out there to help a friend of mine with a new business he was starting, which was a commercial diving business, and Walid was a, a fellow employee. But whilst Michelle was focusing on her job, 30-year-old Walid was focusing his charms on her. Walid came across as a really charming sort of really nice guy, you know, with a future, ambitious. He's a charmer. <laughs> I so do ways about her. Michelle and her English husband had divorced four years earlier. She fell in love with Egyptian Walid because he seemed to offer something different. With our upbringing, we can be a bit cold, but Walid had something which I, I hadn't had before, whereas they are more emotional. He would say he loved you. He was a very passionate, I would even say. So that actually does reel you in. Once Walid and Michelle became a couple, she imagined they would start a family and have a long life together. We were going to travel, we were going to have a child, and we were going to have maybe live for six months in the UK and six months in Egypt. He painted a, a, a wonderful picture of the life we were going to have together. Just like Michelle, 
Diane was looking forward to a bright future with Mobert, who she'd met in 2009 in Gambia, a country near to his native Guinea. He looked after me beautifully. He was very careful, very protective, very attentive. He had the most beautiful smile. He had mentioned marriage, and I was a little bit alarmed. I wasn't naive. I knew that there was a risk that this wasn't genuine. Almost two years after they met, Diane pushed her doubts to one side, and in November 2010, Diane and Mobert got married. But immediately after the wedding, Diane began to question why Mobert had been so keen to marry. We got back to the hotel and I, I noticed a change almost that quickly. He was celebrating with his friends, really, and he wasn't celebrating marrying the love of his life or the future in that. He was celebrating his achievement. He'd married a European woman. He now had in his possession a wedding certificate that was almost like the holy grail to him. He could hardly let go of it, and he'd achieved everything he could possibly achieve at that point in his life. Diane and Mobert had decided they'd live in the UK once they were married. As their wedding was recognised in Britain, Diane could now apply for the visa that allowed Mobert to officially make that move. When I look at the wedding photographs, I was happy, and I honestly thought he was too. But Diane and Mobert were not destined for a lifelong marriage. In 2007, two years after meeting Egyptian Walid, Michelle married him here at Deerham Registry Office. I did love him. I thought the world of him. Yeah, I did. I suppose that was a chance of happiness. I felt that I'd found someone that shared my dreams. I can remember walking in hair. I can remember my family sort of being hair because that's just the memories, I suppose, coming back to me. Michelle had brought Walid to the UK on a fiancé visa. I had to convince immigration that, um, you know, he, he was basically going to sort of settle with me and stay with me, etc. The fact that he could work, um, the fact that I could support him initially as a sponsor. Walid wasn't allowed to work and she had to decide whether to marry him within six months. If um, I wouldn't have married him on the fiancé visa, he would have had to go back to his own country. My preference would have been to wait longer, but I actually felt the immigration system itself was pressuring me to marry him. I did what I did, and there's nothing in this whole world that's going to change my decision. But I would have never dreamed in a million years my life would have taken such a turn by making that decision on that day. Michelle's decision to get married would change her life forever. Coming up, we meet another woman who feels deceived by the man she fell in love with. He was going to treat me like a princess, buy me anything I wanted, to go on holidays. He was promising me everything. And we travel to America to reveal how securing a love rat's green card left one woman's future in ruins. So upsetting. I couldn't believe that I was just a pawn to actually get him to the United States. Holiday love rats know no boundaries. A growing number of women are being promised eternal love, but are then left broken hearted. Indiana in America is home to 53 year old Jane. I have Latif's emails and immigration papers. In 2005, mum of two Jane was going through a divorce when she started looking at internet dating sites. Just was kind of wanting to date, see what kind of people were out there. Really don't think I was looking for anything serious. It was more just someone to go out, have fun, I'll go out to dinner and just enjoy the times. This all changed when Jane was contacted by Nigerian Latif Balogun. His messages were very romantic. He did a lot of romantic quotes, was very, very sweet. Then 43, Jane messaged and spoke to 33-year-old Latif every day. Latif claimed to be living in America. I noticed things were kind of broken with the English, so I asked him, you know, where are you actually from? Because you just don't sound like, you know, you, you don't speak the same way that I, I speak. And he admitted that he was born in Africa, 
and said that he lived in Cleveland on a work visa. When Jane questioned Latif further, he told her that he had to return to Nigeria to be with his sick father. But Jane later discovered that Latif had always been in Nigeria. I was fairly new to the internet. I did try to investigate, you know, what type of people came from Nigeria, and I did notice that I'd find a lot of women that would say they couldn't understand why the men from there were, were so willing to lie to women, and that kind of had my guard up. But I still wanted to believe that, you know, he was being honest with me. Um, and it just, I, I kind of was a little egotistical about thinking, well, you know, maybe I'm, that I'm different. Just over eight months after first chatting to Latif, Jane traveled to Nigeria on holiday to meet her new man for the first time. Totally fell in love with him during that time, alone with him. And he basically treated me like a queen, waited on me hand and foot. It just was a whirlwind. And I was just so smitten with him. It was on that first trip in 2006 that Jane and Latif got married. The proposal was actually online before I went. Um, and he actually had the wedding pretty much planned for when I got down there and that out of registry. It was very romantic, African drums, the whole, the whole thing. After the wedding, Jane returned to the US alone. Despite now being married, Latif didn't have the right to enter America. Jane began a two-year fight for the visa that would allow her new husband residence in her homeland. But Jane had no idea what troubles lay ahead. Sixty-four-year-old Patricia lives in the Midlands. She suffers from acute osteoarthritis and rarely goes out. In the autumn of 2011, Patricia was feeling lonely and decided to join a dating website. I was looking for love. I was looking for um, somebody who I thought I could really love. 29-year-old Monda Mesny from Tunisia got in touch. When he was messaging me, it was exciting because I thought I'd found the person that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. This was Patricia's first time on a dating site, and Monda seemed to offer everything she was looking for. When he first contacted me, he was... He, he was all lovey-dovey. He started telling me he loved me when we'd been talking about three weeks and was asking me to go up there and go up there for a holiday. Monda convinced Patricia they should be together, despite being from different countries and him being 33 years younger. I just thought, well, age is just a number. And he kept drilling that into my head. Age is just a number. As long as you love each other, that's all that matters. It made me feel good because he was younger than me. And I thought, well, you know, I can still pull men at that age, you know what I mean? And it just made me feel good. Despite Patricia's crippling disabilities, within six months, she took a holiday to Tunisia to meet Monda. It was love at first sight. When I got to the airport in Tunisia, he was there waiting for me. And as soon as I saw him, I just fell in love with him straight away. Monda seemed to feel the same way. I've been there about five days. And he said to me, he says, right, let's get married. Let's do it. And I was thinking to myself, I love the guy, you know. So I thought, I'd go for it. But Patricia's dream of a long and happy life with Monda was about to turn into a nightmare. When I look at him now, I think to myself, what a fool I've been. I feel as I've been used, abused. And I made a right fool of myself. In 2009, African drum teacher Diane fell in love with Mobear. 
After nearly two years, they married in Gambia before beginning life as newlyweds in Diane's Staffordshire home. Almost immediately, money was an issue. I was pretty horrified when he arrived with one suitcase. I thought, wow, he, he's expecting me to just buy him a whole wardrobe of clothes and has no concept of money. Diane had paid for Mobert's visa application and was supporting him whilst he looked for work as a musician. It was very difficult financially and it caused a lot of problems. He hadn't earned enough money to really contribute to our lives in the household and when he did earn money, he didn't want to give me any of it. After paying for everything for three years, as well as sending gifts and money to Mobert's family in Africa, Diane said she'd spent thousands of pounds, almost all of her savings. He went to Guinea again in 2013. I couldn't afford it, so we managed, I managed to get enough money together for him to go. When he went, everything changed. I had Skype calls from him and he would say, don't contact me, which was very alien to me. He always kept in touch, and, and I said, what do you mean, don't contact you? You're my husband, what's happening? Mobes stayed in Guinea for three months, but just a few weeks after his return, Diane found a letter in Mobes' luggage, which seemed to prove he was planning to end their marriage. It's a description of how to apply for citizenship without having to be in a marriage any longer. He, of course, said, I've never seen that piece of paper before in my life and refused to acknowledge that he knew what it was and was not prepared to tell me who'd written it. And you can imagine my shock at finding that. Awful. Because musician Mobert had now been married to Diane and resident in the UK for three years, he could apply for British citizenship. He knew that after three years of being in a marriage, any marriage to a British person, he could get British citizenship, which would entitle him to travel throughout Europe freely without a visa. After discovering the note, Diane confronted Mobert. Even with me, as, as um, patient as I'd been, he knew time was running out. So, eventually, he decided to hold himself up in this spare bedroom and live in here, basically. I remember during those days, I was sitting downstairs and he came down and sat on the stairs halfway down and he just sat on the stairs playing with his tablet. And I remember feeling strangely, desperately sorry for him. Yeah. And I said, why are you, why are you sitting there? Come down. But he didn't, he went back upstairs then. But it was so sad and it was almost like a cry for help, really. And I'll never forget that. The relationship was over. There was no turning back, he knew that. He knew there was no turning back then. He just thought he'd, he'd done everything he needed to do and he was ready to get his citizenship and looking forward to it. Probably as excited about that as he was about the marriage. Mobert left Diane with his insults ringing in her ears. He said to me in Susu, your mother is a, an unrepeatable word, a terrible, terrible thing to say to me. That was the last thing he ever said to me. No. Michelle married her Egyptian husband, Walid, in 2007. Like Diane, she also paid for a visa that would let him remain in the UK and supported him as he looked for work as a deep sea diver. You know, I remember him standing Oh, in the lounge one day and that and he was like because he wanted this diving course and that he was really being quite intimidating because he wanted me to get a credit card and because he wanted me to pay for this diving course so i ended up doing it and the only reason i did it was because he said he was going to pay me back and that but there was always a reason in the end through the whole relationship why he couldn't pay it back oh my god there's so much of it but four years into their marriage, and just a month after getting his British passport, Walid bought a plane ticket to Egypt and never came back. He received his British passport on the 5th of December. By the 31st of December, he was booking tickets for Egypt Air to get out of there, to go leave the UK. So that was just that quick. So um, as soon as he got what he wanted, he was out. Three years on, 
Michelle's wounds are still very raw. A black jacket, which I got in my room, he rarely liked aftershave. And for a while there afterwards, when he left, I had it in bed with me because I could smell him. Michelle divorced Walid in October 2012, but while she's still struggling to move on, he has remarried and had a child. Now, after two years of silence, he's suddenly back in touch. Yesterday, I got a message. It's so hard to forget somebody who gave you so much to remember, just like on a little banner. Uh, I got a message the day before, what was I doing? And then I had a message saying that his daughter had been rushed into hospital and that she nearly died. But I found it all rather strange because um, if your daughter was ill, why would you be, uh, you know, what's happened to your ex-wife, who you haven't seen for nearly three years, in the UK? But if Walid's messages were surprising, his next request was an even bigger shock. He's told me that his um, Egyptian wife has died of cancer, and basically, would I look after his child? Walid's request has touched on some raw emotions. Well, we did try for a child, you see. That's something that isn't going to happen now, so... Michelle's chance to have children of her own has passed, so Walid's plea for help pulls heavily on her heartstrings. Why would he be contacting me? He's got family. You know, we're not exactly close now after everything he did, so I just find it very, very odd. Walid's messages have left Michelle in turmoil. Should she believe him? In Staffordshire, it's been less than a year since Diane's husband made an unexpected exit. Because of the emotional effect it had on me, I lost eight teeth at the back. Um, I had alopecia, my hair started to fall out. It's just growing back again nicely now. And um, I also gained weight. I don't think I'll ever get over it. It is like a bereavement, the, the emotions that you feel, but it's not like a bereavement because the person that caused this pain, the suffering, is still out there. Bruised and broken-hearted, Diane's en route to meet a therapist specialising in love and relationships. I'm hoping it's going to be a little bit cathartic and help me to understand more about, about what's happened, really. Donna Dawson wants to help Diane deal with some very painful emotions. How did he make you feel loved? That's a good question. It felt so natural. It mm. felt like any courtship. See, the thing about Western notion of love is that you, you start off with this kind of blank canvas upon which you project your needs and desires. Mm -hmm. The person becomes the blank canvas. Your needs and desires go on that. And what we tend to do with our rose-colored spectacles is disregard anything that doesn't fit. Yes. And of course, when we have to then face the ugly truth, um, we go into a kind of bereavement for the relationship we thought we had. Mm -hmm. How do you feel now, looking back on it? What do you take from it? I've got anger. Sure. I'm much better health-wise now, because I was physically and mentally a mess. I'm guilty. I feel guilty. I feel sad. You can't fully be blamed, because you, you actually saw a progression there that you could believe in. You've got to hold your head up high and say, I went in that with yeah, best intentions. Yeah. And you, my darling, you are going to be OK. Yes. You will be. I feel quite um, cleansed to a degree, I'm a lot more confident. I feel far more ready and prepared to move on now and to enjoy my life more, I think, and enjoy me more. Coming up, Jane reveals how her love rat lied about almost everything. This is the actual email that he was sending out to hundreds of women. And Michelle tries to find out more about her ex-husband's baby. It's ringing. Patricia, who is chronically disabled, says she knew she loved Tunisian Monda from the first moment she saw him on holiday in 2011. It was promising to be with me here, and he was going to treat me like a princess, buy me anything I wanted to go on holidays. He was promising to get a car, 
take me anywhere I wanted to go. It was, it was promising me everything. Monda, then 26, proposed to Patricia, who was 60, on their first holiday together. After another two trips, in November 2012, Patricia married him in Tunisia. On my wedding day, when you was reading the vows, I felt so happy. I was treated like a princess by my husband's parents. They were very, very good to me. It was a, a woman's dream to go to a different country and marry a younger man. It was, it was wonderful. I was really, really happy. But it wasn't just Patricia who was being treated. She's a pensioner and says the wedding cost her hundreds of pounds. I had to pay for everything in Tunisia. Well, I paid for the wedding rings. I had to pay for a sheep that they, um, they slaughtered for the food for the wedding. After the wedding, Patricia returned to the UK alone. She had to wait for Monda to get a visa to allow him to join her in the Midlands. I didn't want to leave him because I fell that much in love with him. Eight months later, Monda secured a visitor's visa and travelled to the UK. But it was far from the emotional reunion Patricia had longed for. He didn't have much communication with me at all. It was like as if once he'd married me, that was it. I felt like I was second best. I remember in the house was a nightmare. It, He'd have an argument with me if I spoke to my daughter on the phone that the marriage wasn't good with him living here. But Monda's visa was running out and Patricia refused to pay for another to allow him to stay in the UK for longer. He kept getting on at me because I hadn't got £2,000 to go and get him a visa to stay in the country. Less than a fortnight after arriving in the Midlands, Monda told Patricia he was leaving. He said, I want to go to Portsmouth, stay with my friend. So he says, can you give me some money, some fare to get up there? I was gutted. I was well gutted. Patricia's marriage was over, almost before it had begun, but Monda stayed in the UK for another year. In 2014, Patricia says the police told her he'd been arrested because his visa had expired and that he was in a detention centre. It was during this time Patricia received a message from Monda asking for money. I don't have no penny baby to buy some stuff at myself. If you can send me £100, I don't have no one to help me in your country, just you, baby. Patricia hasn't given Monda any more money. Instead, she wants him out of her life and out of the UK. I just want him to get out of the country and move on with his life and don't have no contact with me ever again. In Staffordshire, Diane's still dealing with the legacy of her marriage to Mobert. He arrived in the UK in 2011. It was at this time that Diane saw evidence making her think Mobert could be in a relationship with another woman whilst married to her. Shortly after Mobert arrived in the UK, he asked me to open his email and jumping out at me was an email that he'd, um, he'd sent to a lady in Holland. Of course, by this time we were married and the, the, the email was written in English and it was exactly the same as the emails that he used to send to me that were, that were promises of love and devotion. They were tools, you know, they were grooming tools, if you like. So I challenged him about it and said, this is a love letter, you know, to this lady in Holland. And of course he denied it and said he didn't write it, it wasn't him because that's what they do. And um, I had to take it on the chin really because by that time we were married, the commitment was made, he was here in the UK. But Mobert was in contact with more than just one other woman. He had lots of conversations with a, a Guinean lady who lived in Italy and I questioned that frequently. 
Diane also received an apology from a woman in Wales who said she was addicted to Mobear. She rang me to tell me, um, I don't know why, um, she rang me to tell me she'd been having an affair with him. Diane also believes the woman was in Guinea with Mobert when he spent three months there, just before he left her. I'd helped her to arrange her trip and supported her with that, not knowing that she was having an affair with my husband whilst I was doing that. That was an awful, awful time for me. He had once said to me during the marriage, um, I want more children, and I'd said to him, well, how are you going to do that then? Because he knew I would never have any more children. And he just looked at me and didn't know what to say because he knew he'd said something rather silly and foolish. And I said, how are you going to do that then? How are you going to have more babies? And he said, you think I'm going to leave this planet with no more babies? I said, well, yeah, OK, how are you going to do it? And I said, are you waiting for me to die? Michelle's ex-husband is playing on her emotions. Out of the blue, he's told her his new wife is dead and has asked her to look after his baby. Him. Michelle wants to speak to Walid directly to work out whether he's telling the truth or if he's got another agenda. He's agreed to be available at five o'clock. Call failed us, Sam. Maybe he's cut me off. That was a bit like that in my marriage at times. You know, they would, they, he let you down. Without talking to Walid, Michelle may never know if he's telling the truth. That's hard for somebody like me who's so straightforward and, you know, probably a bit too honest sometimes. In Staffordshire, Diane's meeting her friend David. Hello, David. Hi, Diane. He's spent a lot of time in Gambia and has heard local men discussing how best to get into a relationship with Western women. I used to sit around in huddles discussing this for hours. First of all, how, how do you find a woman? Mm -hmm. What age range do you go for? Mm -hmm. what, what are the easiest to attract? And then once you're in England, stories would come back about how you manipulate things in England and how you go about it. So they used to sit around for hours and discussing these you know, processes that they'd go through. Nearly six years after her first trip to the Gambia, Diane's reassessed her experience and what she thinks Mobert's motives were. What he did was massive. He left his friends, his family, his culture, his music, his life, even the food that he ate. He left it all behind to be here in the UK. Not as I thought to be with me, but to be in the UK, hopefully, make a good amount of money to send home to build a house for his terribly impoverished family in a third world country and, and to care for them and look after them. And that was, his, that was his aim. I always thought that it was me, but looking back, it wasn't. In Norfolk, Michelle is also counting the cost of her marriage to Walid. He left a shocking surprise. When he left, he said, oh, he said, don't open my bank, um, bank statements and my credit card statements. So I smelt a dirty big rat straight off. <laughs> so I opened them. <laughs> Walid left debts of over nine and a half thousand pounds. Oh, it's just so much hair. This one, 3,281.85. Oh, 6309, which was, I think, was connected with his phone contract. Then I got stuff to do with doorstep debt collection notices. The bills are in his name, but Michelle is still affected. It would appear that there's been a link made between my credit and his, so that's affected my credit rating. Um, I can't do anything. I can't really even fix my place up or anything. I can't do anything now. He's sort of even messed that up for me. All my hopes and dreams have gone down the drain now at the moment. Michelle isn't the only woman to suffer financial damage as a result of her failed marriage to a love rat. Diane has also lost valuable assets. He lost a very expensive pen. He lost a laptop that I gave him at one point that disappeared, a video camera. Oh, it's endless, endless the amount of things that he lost. Everything, really. And he would say that material things didn't mean anything to him, but... <laughs> 
American Jane says she spent thousands of dollars on the legal fees for her Nigerian husband's entry visa. But less than eight weeks after Latif legally arrived in America, Jane made a startling discovery. This is the actual email that he was sending out to hundreds of women. Jane saw on her computer that Latif had sent an identical email to almost 100 different women. Hello, everybody is talking about love, but how many of us knows what love really is? Love is not about finding the right person alone, but also creating a right relationship. My name is Latif. I just got to the USA from Africa, and I live in Indiana, but I want to meet a serious woman who would like to have a strong and loving relationship. I'm married, but not happy with her. I believe she is my lover, not my soulmate. This discovery meant there was no going back. I immediately contacted him to ask him what was going on, and he denied and stated that it was his brother. At this point, the believability was gone. Um, there was nothing he was going to do that was going to convince me that he was not actually the one doing it, because it was right there in front of my face. It was very devastating. It was a case of, I really can't believe I fell for this the whole time, and that I fought family and friends for two years. Um, and you find out that, no, he really was lying the whole time. Jane made Latif leave and filed for divorce. But despite now being divorced, Latif can legally remain in the US for at least 10 years. Angry. Oh, I was so angry that I'd spent this much time and this much money to bring him here for him to have lied the whole time. It was just awful, just an awful feeling. Coming up, Jane's family reveal how Latif affected their lives. We really tried to welcome them and give them a chance, but you can't change who a person is just because you welcome them into your home. Michelle challenges the law. There doesn't seem to be much focus on what happens after they get British citizenship. Who's to say that they can't persuade the court that the relationship naturally came to an end? And Patricia investigates the pros and cons of getting a divorce. How would I go about it? And how much is it going to cost? Michelle's world was turned upside down when her Egyptian husband left just a month after receiving his British passport. Motivated by her sense of injustice, Michelle has started a campaign called Stop UK Marriage Fraud to help people who feel they were fooled into fake marriages. I couldn't do that to anybody and I'm going to do whatever it takes to basically raise awareness in the public domain and tell people what's going on. Thank you for coming today. Today, Michelle's meeting barrister Paula Roan Adrian to discuss the current immigration laws, which Michelle thinks offer little protection. Previously, the period of time to get a visa was two years in which the application could be made, and that's been extended to five years. There doesn't seem to be much focus on um, actually what happens after they mm. get British citizenship. You can be in a relationship with someone for years and who's to say that if they do go before the courts that they can't persuade the court that the relationship naturally came to an end? I actually went to my MP who actually um, wrote to the Chief Constable. They sent two CID officers round. Um, they discussed what happened with me. The fact he left a month after British citizenship, uh, they actually took no action. Oh, Michelle, I know that this is frustrating, but you've got to advise all your followers that they should do the same, because remember, indefinite leave to remain and citizenship can now be revoked due to the new law. Although I have to be honest with you and say that I don't know of any case in a situation like yours that has gone to court and succeeded. It's frustrating news for Michelle, but she's determined to make a difference. Sadly, Michelle's is a story that is reflected around the world. Jane reported her ex-husband to the US immigration authorities, but believes he is still in America. Oh, this is messy. I would pick a messy food, huh? Despite this, Jane and her sons, Evan and Kyle, are returning to the normality of life without him. 
I mean, we really tried to welcome them and give them a chance, but, I mean, you can't change who a person is just because you welcome them into your home. Latif hasn't responded to any of the allegations. Looking back, I wanted to believe that he was telling me the truth. I think I'm strong enough now to know better. Now I know what his personality really is and what he's really like. And, and no, I, would, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go through it again. Um, I couldn't put my family through it again. I would have to tell anyone that's been through anything similar, hold your head up. It's not your fault and you can't just hide in a hole afterwards. You have to fight back. Like Jane, Patricia, who is disabled and living on a pension, is also trying to move on and forget all about her Tunisian husband. All the time I was with Manda, he never once bought me a bunch of flowers, a box of chocolates, nothing. I had to pay for everything. I'd rather him be back in Tunisia so he can move on with his life and so can I. Patricia wants a divorce, but having already spent thousands on holidays, flights for Monda, and a wedding in Tunisia, she wants to know if she can afford it. How are you? Pleasure I'm to fine, meet you. thank you. She's visiting her local solicitor to see what a divorce might cost. I wanted to know about a divorce. How would I go about it and how much, you know, is it going to cost? The way to get a divorce would be by way of um, petitioning in the county court. Court costs are generally £410 to do this. We do a fixed fee that starts from about £650 plus VAT. I'm only on a pension. It's not the result Patricia was hoping for, but there is some fresh news about Monda. Patricia now believes he is back in Tunisia. He's at my life now. It, I can just get on with my own life now. But even though Monda has left Patricia, she is still married to him, and without any way of paying for a divorce, she's stuck in her failed marriage. When asked to comment, Monda said his marriage to Patricia collapsed due to circumstances beyond his control, that he loved Patricia and that he didn't come to England for money. Diane reported Mobe to the police and believes he is now working in Italy. Despite her failed marriage, she has rekindled her love of African music. But has come to a damning conclusion on her decision to marry Mobe. I made that decision based on what I believed to be the truth. I made that decision based on the fact that we were in love, based on the fact that we had a future together. And the foundations of that were, were all lies. So that sort of relinquishes me of some of the guilt and responsibility I, I, in the past, have taken on board. Mobert has been sent these allegations, but hasn't responded. We also contacted Michelle's ex-husband, Walid, who hasn't told us his side of the story. Five months after Walid renewed contact with Michelle, she doesn't want to allow her husband back into her life. She may have longed for children, but she has decided Walid will have to look after his own baby. I've got no sympathy for him whatsoever. I think he can um, rot in hell. But the little girl, I feel sorry for. If she's not got a little mum, you know, her mum, I feel sorry for the little girl. Um, not him, no. Nothing for him. No. He deserve all he get. Next time on Holiday Love Rats Exposed... I thought, oh, this is my Mr. Right, who I've been waiting for all my life. Four more women who fell in love with a man from another country. Most women would dream to have a handsome man from an exotic place. Be in love with them. My dreams were coming true. But now believe the men they fell for were only interested in their money. He suddenly said, I need your help. He said, I don't have the money to get back home. Credit card, long-term loan, another credit card. It's going to take 17 years to clear this little lot up. Holiday resorts worldwide see thousands of British women letting their hair down. And some are seduced by eager local men. The fact that he was younger, at the back of my mind, it was, <laughs> yeah, I can still pull. It made me feel like, wow, I'm really something. I really felt very, very special. 
drawn in by the promise of a new exotic life, some even get married. It was a, a very wonderful day, but the whole time was, it was in the back of my head. Am I doing the right thing? But often these relationships come at a high cost. I was head butting walls, she I was punching walls. She washed us comfortably. I was hysterical. He put his face in my face and he said to me, you are my wife now. You do as you're told now. And after spending thousands, some will wonder if they've been scammed. I now believe that he'd actually been just stringing me along, getting as much as he could. Somebody that I gave my heart to just basically threw it out to the curb. The spice market in central Istanbul, the perfect place to pick up something Turkish. Thank you very much. See you again. Bye. 54-year-old Tracy loves it here. Oh, such a good idea. I love this. <laughs> and she's used to the ways of this part of the world. Are you from Germany or England? England. Manchester. Because <laughs> I want to get married. You want to get married? What, and move to England? Yes. Oh, I'm sure you'll find them on the internet. The men, they see an English face. They try anything. Tracy says she was never in the market for love. I hadn't had a relationship for years after my divorce. I wasn't interested in men. I was quite happy. I didn't want to meet a man. But in 2009, while Tracy was online, a handsome 31-year-old from the southeast area of Turkey said hi. He was friendly, and we just got chatting, and he seemed like a decent guy. He had a decent job. He was a dialysis technician. He was very attentive. He was very flattering. His name was Bulent Doan, and he turned on the charm. Tracy was seduced by the thought of a life full of Eastern promise. Within weeks, he was telling me that he loved me. And to be honest, I had got very strong feelings for him too. It just felt right. And from there, I went out to meet him in Istanbul. For Tracy, this was going to be a holiday to remember. After being single for 10 years, she was about to spend a whole holiday with the man of her dreams. We're both like school kids. Basically, it was like our first day ever, I think. And I was shaking, he was shaking. Tracy felt they clicked instantly. He <laughs> made me feel good, he made me feel alive again, to be honest. And the fact that he was younger, I think, at the back of my mind, it was, <laughs> yeah, I could still pull. Despite the excitement, Tracy found out Bulent's job back home wasn't quite as well paid as she had assumed, and he was skint. He didn't have that much money to spend, and I ended up paying for most things there. And I think it came to the crunch on a night when we'd just had a couple of drinks in the room, and he suddenly said, I need your help. He said, I don't have the money to get back home. So on the final day of the holiday, we ended up going up to the airport and buying him a ticket to get back home. I funded that ticket, and he never offered the money back. Tracy was to return home in love, but out of pocket. Egypt, a country popular with tourists and lovers of ancient art and history. American artist Corin came on holiday here 16 years ago. I always thought of art as being a talent that was innate and God-given, and I needed to use it and develop it. Whilst touring the country, Corinne also exhibited some of her art, and this attracted the attention of an Egyptian lawyer called Taha Hassan. It made me feel like, wow, I'm really something. I really felt very, very special, and it was just the icing on the cake for me. When the holiday was over, Corinne returned to the US, and the pair stayed in touch. Corinne was married, but years later divorced, and in 2009, Taha made his move. He seemed very persistent, wanting me to come to Egypt. He had proposed to me online and said, I'd like for you to marry me when you come to Egypt. And I thought, wow. Corinne thought this was perfect timing. 
she booked a holiday to Egypt and promised to marry her Egyptian lawyer. Within days of her arriving, the wedding went ahead. I think most women would dream to have handsome men from an exotic place, be in love with them. My dreams were coming true that my life was really going to be really fantastic at that point. They call it sarma. And sometimes they put meat in it. Sometimes they just put vegetables like I'm doing, because I've got vegetarian friends. Trace's holiday in Turkey with her new love, Bulent, was a great success, even though she had paid for everything. When she returned home, he asked Tracy to help him pay a phone bill. He claimed he had a bill for a mobile phone he was being taken to court for. I actually said, how much, how much is it for? It was a lot more than I expected. It was 16, 1700 lira. She gave Bulent money to cover the bill, but he didn't provide a receipt. It was just the first big bill Tracy says she was asked to pay. Adding up the hotels, flights and other gifts, Tracy says it was an expensive relationship. Over the three and a half years that I went out to see him, I will have spent in excess of £16,000. And it could have been a, a lot, lot more had it gone on any longer. The sky is cloudy today, so is my mood. In Egypt in 2009, Corin married her new love, Taha, but she had to go home to the US without him. Taha's packing. We're both trying not to get emotional, but it's hard. It's hard for me to deal with this. I can't tell you how hard it is. Getting a visa for Taha was not easy. It was going to take years. There's my sweet husband, whom I cannot live without. When Corin returned home to the US, Taha lost his job as a lawyer, so she agreed to wire him money. $250, $250 again in March the following year, another one in April for $250. At the end of April in 2010, $2,200. They go on and on and on. Over the next four years, Taha could not get a visa or a job, so Corin kept supporting him. I love my wife. And I will miss her so much. But inside of me, I know and I believe we won't be apart so long. Our time will come so soon. Eventually, the visa did arrive, and Taha made the trip to the US. Corin did everything to make him feel at home, including putting his name on her bank account. We made sure Tahir got a social security card. You know, he had the cell phone. I put him on a bank account to make sure he had access to funds. I had invested so much of my life and my effort into accommodating him and making sure he was happy. I didn't want him to be uncomfortable after he arrived. But Corin had no idea what Tahir was about to do. Coming up, Tracy thinks she's been scammed. The money that he took from me was a thousand pound for a mobile phone bill that I now believe didn't exist. And a mum from Yorkshire meets her dream Turkish man. I was so excited, I've never been married before, and I thought, oh, Mr. Wright, you know, I'm happy with him. Holiday love rats promise a new and exotic life, but often these relationships leave the women in tears and seriously out of pocket. Bodrum in Turkey. In 2007, 48-year-old Elaine from Yorkshire was on her honeymoon with her 27-year-old Turkish husband, Adam Gula. I thought, oh, this is my Mr. Right, who I've been waiting for all my life. We went to Turkey for a month. We had two weeks holiday on our road and then two weeks traveling to visit relatives and his family. And I got introduced to everyone, aunties, uncles, granddads, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters. So I had a great time. Apart from I couldn't speak Turkish, I didn't understand what they were all talking about. It was a holiday Elaine will never forget. She thought her life had changed forever. It was like a Prince Charming. It was opening doors and doing all the right things what some of us women like, being treated like a lady. 
Elaine's love affair with Adam began in 2003, soon after he arrived in the UK. I was on a girls' night out in the town in the city centre. We went to our usual nightclub where we go every Wednesday night. I saw him across the dance floor and I thought, oh, he looks a bit all right. I says to one of the girls, so she goes across and she tells him, comes over and we have a drink together. He said he was looking for an older woman and that was it. That start of my relationship. Adam was a dream come true. I was attracted to him because he was dark, dark hair, dark eyes. He had a nice body, he had an airy chest, which I like that. <laughs> I was happy, he was over the moon. But Adam had a confession to make. He was already married to an English woman. A few years before he met me, Adam met a lady on the holiday resort and they got married in Turkey. And then after a while, he got a visa to come over to the UK. And then they weren't together very long. They split up and he moved town. Just thought, well, they didn't stay together very long. So I, I asked him why they didn't stay together very long. And he said, when he got into the country, as soon as the plane landed, she changed. Elaine was in love. Adam got a divorce, but remained in the UK on his marriage visa. And in 2006, he asked Elaine to marry him. I was so excited, I've never been married before, and I thought, oh, Mr Wright, you know, I'm happy with him. So we'll go ahead and booked it. It was only about three weeks later after we'd spoke about it around the Christmas time, got married January the 7th. But only a short time into her honeymoon, Elaine started to worry about married life with Adam. When we went to Turkey, he, he said he was taking £10,000 to lend to his brother. And he also took his mum, I think it was 5000 because she wanted a new toilet because she had the type that went into the floor. And he wanted his mum to have a proper toilet, like an English toilet. He used to go get them contract, contract mobile phones and I had an old second-hand phone. I just didn't understand it. In an English marriage, what's yours is mine and what's mine's yours, you know, it's ours. But not being mar married to a Turkish man, it's not, his money's his. And he knew that and he told me that. In Warwickshire lives 52-year-old Anne-Marie. Hello, can I get a glass of white wine, please? On a night out in 2005, she met a man from the Gambia called Omar Sonko. He's a very handsome, charismatic guy. Came along and um, started chatting to me, told me, stay with me and you'll never want for anything. I'll look after you, I'll treat you like a queen. He was, you know, he, he, he told me everything I wanted to hear, I suppose. She wasn't so sure, but he was. Anne-Marie was 41 at the time, Omar was 21. There was text after text after text, there was voicemails, there were missed calls from him constantly. He was, he was absolutely adamant that he wanted to, to make a connection with me. So I thought, well, OK, why not, you know? Anne-Marie gave in to Omar's charms, took a holiday from work and their relationship began. He later confessed he needed somewhere to live. He had said to me that he was terrible with money and he was struggling to pay his rent and um, it just was a natural progression, if you like, that, that he would come and move in with me because then, you know, he would contribute to help me and that would also help him. Within months of him moving in, the couple had booked their first holiday to the Gambia. Omar really wanted Anne-Marie to meet his family and they decided to get married. Anne-Marie says Omar's current UK visa had run out, so he needed a new one to stay in the country. He had come to the country on a student visa. He had not been able to finish the course. He needed to send money back home, otherwise people wouldn't be able to eat. And I kind of admired his strength for staying and, and doing what he's been doing to keep his family going. Anne-Marie and Omar got married in March 2006. I have the wedding photographs here, all the photographs that we, we took. It was a, a very wonderful day, very humbling and 
and very lovely. But I still had doubts on my wedding day. The whole time was, it was in the back of my head, am I doing the right thing? Anne-Marie says it wasn't long before the fairy tale came to an end. The day after we were married, there was an argument. He looked at me, his eyes were like bulging out of his head. He put his face in my face and he said to me, you are my wife now. You do as you're told now. I was really frightened. And then I thought, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? I really think I've made a big mistake. In 2009, Tracy from Manchester had started seeing Bulent Doan, who lived in Turkey and made regular holiday trips to be with him. But she quickly found the relationship was costing her a small fortune. She continued seeing him for more than three years, but then enough was enough. He didn't pay towards anything. The money that he took from me was a thousand pound for a mobile phone bill and then the final straw was when he asked for a £2,000 loan. The loan was for a kebab shop. Bulent said he needed to pay for a licence to trade. Tracy wired the cash, but she never saw it again. I just felt devastated. I had trusted this guy. I'd given him a chance. And he'd, all the time, I now believe that he'd actually been just stringing me along, getting as much as he could. Three years ago, Tracy filed a case to a Turkish court, demanding Bulent pay her back. But the case was not taken any further because he didn't have any money. He's had long enough to cope with some form of payment plan. And now I think I need to seek some more advice, see if there's anything that I can do to actually make him pay the money back. Anne-Marie from Warwickshire had just got married in the Gambia to a man called Omar. It was a fairy tale wedding, but the very next day, she says, his mood changed. When the couple returned to the UK, she says her life was made intolerable. I think he'd only been back a couple of weeks. He became very, very aggressive and started to become violent. Anne-Marie says rows were common and often about money. He once smashed up the kitchen and she recalls one particularly bad beating. He held me to the floor with his hand in his foot and then he took his belt off and he had this thick studded belt um, and he started to whip me over and over again on the top of my thigh. Um, I was crying and screaming and begging him to stop and he just kept whipping me over and over again. At one point during it, I, I did shout to him, you know, is this how you control your girlfriends? And he shouted yes back to me. The violence was not the only thing Anne-Marie says she had to endure. She says Omar often demanded money, forcing her to take out loans and borrow on credit cards. This is all of the short-term doorstep loans that I took out in the course of my relationship with Omar. He would ask me to, if he could borrow money to send back to his family, but I found out later that actually um, uh, he would tell uh, his family back in the Gambia he couldn't send them anything this month because he was giving it all to me, and he would tell me he couldn't give me anything towards the housekeeping because he needed to send it all to the Gambia. Life became awful, to be honest. Um, it was a, the spiralling debts, the constant violence. Um, he never had any money. He was always having to say no to the kids when they wanted something. It was, it was just, it was just horrible. The relationship lasted five years, and then Omar left. Anne Marie took a non-molestation order out against him to stop him returning. She now wonders if she can track him down to help pay off the debts she was left with. I was with this man for a long time and um, I now have £15,000 worth of debts which I just can't pay. What I intend to do is to see if there's some way I can find out where he is and, um, and see if I can get any, any help, any money from him towards these debts, which technically are half of his. 
Back in Washington, Corinne had spent years sending thousands of dollars to support her jobless Egyptian husband, Taha Hassan, while they waited for his American visa to arrive. He finally got his visa and in 2014 flew to the US and everything seemed perfect. Taher had kissed me and said, I just need you to know you're very, very beautiful. I'm going to love you forever and take care of you. But just 31 days after he arrived, Corin became concerned when she got a bizarre message from Taher. I received a text from him saying he was going to New York to sign the papers. He was not alone. I didn't understood what that mean. I tried phoning him and texting him and got no response. Corin went home and Taha wasn't there. Concerned about what was happening, she contacted her bank, who confirmed suspicious activity on their joint account. He went to the bank where we had a joint account, trying to withdraw as much money as he could. One two, three, four, five withdrawals in the amount of $200, just a few minutes apart with each withdrawal, $696 for a one-way airline ticket to Cairo. When I'd spoken to the um, bank officers, they had told me he had tried to make many other withdrawals. 24 hours later, Corin says she received a devastating email from Taha. He had returned to Egypt and asked that she never contact him again. I was suicidal. I thought nobody's ever going to love me ever again. I'm going to be alone the rest of my life. Somebody that I gave my heart, my life to, just basically threw it out to the curb. Coming up, Elaine's dream marriage is also about to turn into a nightmare. I was head butting walls, she I was punching walls, walls. She was, she was cuddly. I was hysterical. And Tracy battles to get her money back. The anger's back again. I can't wait to see this lawyer. I just hope they can do something about it. Tracy from Manchester ended her relationship with her Turkish ex when she says he failed to pay back a £2,000 business loan. She's come to London to meet Action Fraud, part of the City of London Police, who recently issued warnings over so-called romance scams. I've never seen a penny, and I'd like to know if there's any way that he can be forced to pay any of the money that he's owing. So I just thought, maybe if I speak to Action Fraud, they could give me some idea of what I could do. The deputy head of Action Fraud is keen to meet Tracy as part of their ongoing intelligence gathering. Welcome, Tracy. Um, you've reported this to us as a romance fraud. Uh -huh. So you said right from the outset you thought there was something wrong. Yeah. And yet yeah, I felt you've still gone in. through. So could, could you sort of explain the sort of process, I if you like. I can't explain. I can't explain, but my story is the same as many, many more. On I run a Facebook group, and there's so many ladies telling the same story, but they have actually met the guys in person first down at the beach or some seaside place or even in land, and they fall into exactly the same trap. I, I thought I was pretty astute before all this. Yeah. I thought I was quite intelligent, but for some reason, they take over. So it's the emotional yeah. attachments that, that are making you be irrational, do it things... Irrational. It was irrational. It was irrational. I can, I'll openly say I was stupid, I was irrational, I wasn't thinking. Everybody thinks the guys are different. Tracy's story may be common, but she is determined to pursue Bolent Dohan for the £2,000 she says she lent him. So as far as the money that I'm owed now, is there anything you could suggest that I could do now? You must pursue that through the Turkish authorities. OK, thank you. She's admitted that she thought from the outset that there was something wrong and the alarm bells were ringing, but she was in love and the rational aspects that you would do, the due diligence you would usually do, go out of the window. Tracy has decided to go back to Turkey to get legal advice about how to get Bulent to pay up. I still feel very, very motivated now 
to go out and seek further advice, just to see what I can do, just to prove a point, because people like this should not be allowed to get away with it. In Warwickshire, Anne-Marie eventually split up with her Gambian husband, Omar Sonko, after suffering domestic violence and years of financial turmoil. She's on her way to see her grown-up son, Joe, and daughter, Steph, from a previous marriage. They all lived together when Omar was on the scene. We were just permanently broke, and they would ask for things. Um, you know, they couldn't go on the expensive school trips like their friends. They couldn't have fashionable clothes. You know, they had to make do with whatever I could afford. Hiya. Right. Hello. Yeah, hello. How's the little beautiful? Anne-Marie's daughter has just had a baby and has a new life. But she clearly remembers the financial chaos in her own childhood. <laughs> A lot of the time, Mum would stress about money, and then as he was unseen longer, um, Mum just seemed to become worse and worse off, really. Hello, oh, beautiful. We weren't sort of able to have anything new, uh, school uniform and stuff. A lot of stuff would, would come second-hand for us because she just simply couldn't afford it. Come on, I've seen pictures of you with a big smile on your face. Her son, Joe, was only 10 when Omar and his mum married. He remembers everything happening very quickly. Well, I was quite young, so I didn't really know an awful lot about relationships, so... But um, it definitely did feel quite quick. She's gripping hold of my thumb. Mm. He was only casually in my life, and then all of a sudden, going from just seeing him a couple of times a week, it would be now, all of a sudden, he's there and he's staying kind of thing. <laughs> Right, OK. Are you going now, yeah? OK? Yeah, see you soon, yeah? See you later. Anne-Marie has over £14,000 of loans she says she was persuaded to take out by her Gambian husband. She now wants to find him to see if he will help pay off the debts. 56-year-old Elaine married Turkish Adam Gula eight years ago. They lived together for three years, and she says life before the wedding was good. But she says married life didn't turn out quite how she'd hoped. He worked nights at a pizza delivery shop, and she stayed at home. The quality of the married life, I think, was bad. It was like two separate people, not a marriage. He was going out making money. He didn't buy me any clothes. I didn't get flowers. I didn't get birthday cards. I didn't get presents. Nothing. Elaine says they continued married life living as strangers. That was until his British passport arrived in the post. His passport came on the Friday, and on the Sunday, he gave me £60, and he says, there's your £60 bed and breakfast, and he smirked. It wasn't a smile, it was a smirk. And then he said, I can start to be myself now, because for seven years, I haven't been able to be myself. On that Monday morning, Elaine was out and called Adam, but he refused to say where he was. Do you want a cup of tea, Elaine? Yes. One sugar? One sugar, please. She became suspicious and called her neighbour, Sharon. Elaine phoned me up and she went, Sharon, is my car outside the front? And I went, oh, yeah, your car's here. She went, is Adam there? And I was like... I can't see him. I went, oh, hang on a second, he's just coming out now. I said, he's loading his car with bin bags and it looks like he's got clothes, Elaine. So she, she went, he's leaving. So she's like, try and stop him. We're like, how am I going to stop him, Elaine? Let down his tyres. I went, I can't let down his tyres. I'll get done for bloody criminal damage. So and I was sat there, he loaded up his car and he went out and literally, it was a couple of minutes, but it wasn't even five minutes, Elaine comes round. She went into the house and it looked like her house had been robbed. And I was just like... Oh, my God. Adam had done a runner. Three days after receiving his British passport, he was gone. Elaine didn't take it well. I was headbutting walls. She I was punching walls. Walls. She was, she was completely... I was hysterical. I was shock, in shock, total shock. But I uh, really loved him, you see, 110%. She did. Uh, it was terrible, terrible. Sharon consoled her neighbour, but she wasn't surprised by what had happened. I mean, I've been to Turkey and I've had them come up to me and chat me up with my husband sat next to me. 
you know, and, and they've offered my husband money as well. We'll, uh, we'll pay for your wife. And I looked at him and I went, don't you dare, I'll kill you. But they, they do offer you money for your wives when you're abroad. I've heard that before. Dale's been offered 100, 100 grand for me. I nearly crapped my pants because he sat and thought about it. Elaine was never to hear from Adam again. He filed for divorce, but he still lives in the UK. I've been left absolutely devastated and ill for the last nearly five years now. Sit miserable, I don't socialise. People's commenting on the way I am and to telling me to cheer up. I'm on antidepressants the last few years. I've doubled them up to try to get out this rut I'm in, but it's not so easy. I just can't seem to move on. Three and a half thousand miles away, Tracy has arrived in Istanbul to seek legal advice to try and get back £2,000 she says she lent her ex, Bulent. She also claims that while she was on her last ever holiday with him, she discovered he was cheating. I was tidying the room up and I decided to put something in his suitcase. There's no clothes in the suitcase, hardly. Um, what there was was winter clothes stuffed in a little bag of mine. I thought, this isn't right. So yeah, I had a look in his case and that was when I found boarding passes from Helsinki to Oslo. I also found a letter from another woman saying, Bulent, you are impossible. I will be at the airport tomorrow, something like you better be there. I waited for him to come back to the room. I actually said to him, why didn't you tell me you've got another woman? There is no other woman. You're paranoid. And then I went to show him. The boarding passes, I went to put my hand on the case. He grabbed my arm so hard. I had bruises down my arm for the rest of the holiday. He still denied it. I was just devastated because I didn't believe he'd do that. Yes, he flirts, but I really didn't believe he'd go and do something like that, but he did. It was then that I thought, hang on, have I been scammed? Later, Tracy will meet a Turkish lawyer. She's prepared to go all the way to get back the money she says she's owed. Back in the UK, and Anne-Marie is also on a mission. She wants to find her Gambian husband, who she says encouraged her to take out thousands of pounds of debt. He's disappeared, but she thinks he should help pay off the loans. I found a website who will trace a debtor on your behalf. Um, it uh, look, looks like a good site. It's a uh, no fine, no fee. For Anne-Marie, ridding herself of the debts is the start of getting her life back together. Before I met Omar, my credit rating was good. <laughs> my rating now, um, well, credit card, £248, a uh, long-term loan, £5,700, so another credit card, £2,500, um, <laughs> just shy of £14,500. At the rate that I'm paying back at the moment, because of what I need for day-to-day -day living, um, it's going to take 17 years to clear this little lot up. It's ridiculous. For Anne-Marie, crippling debts are not the only indignity she suffered at the hands of Omar. She believes he was also having an affair. I caught sight of an email, which I do now have, um, which is a, a pretty young lady, much younger than me, sending a photograph of herself via her mobile phone to my husband. And then a few months later, I had a subsequent phone call from the same, from the same lady. Anne-Marie and Omar soon separated. He's not allowed to go near the house and she's not seen nor heard from him for years. Unless I can actually find out where he is, then I can't recover any of it. I mean, I can't even divorce him um, unless I know where he is, because I, I can't serve any papers on him. So um, I think this is the way ahead. Tracy also has a plan. She's in Istanbul to meet a lawyer to try to get back the money she says she lent her ex, Bulent. But when I asked Bulent why he'd scammed me, the first thing he said, and it stuck in my head, it was easy. I want settlement. I've not been able to say anything 
face to face to him because he didn't have the guts. And if I hadn't found the other woman's details within his suitcase, I would have still been none the wiser. This is the first time Tracy has seen a translated statement from Boulent, who says he thought the money was a gift, not a loan. According to this, I provided £2,000 sterling for purpose of, purposes of providing support and assistance to him. I gave him the money for assistance only. He didn't deceive me or betray me in any way. The anger's back again. I can't wait to see this lawyer. I just hope they can do something about it. Coming up, Anne-Marie may finally get rid of her huge debts. I think I can put my hands on enough evidence to prove that I was coerced into several of these loans. And Tracy considers criminal action against her ex. This is principle. It's nothing to do with money. It's nothing to do with finances. This is actually principle. In Warwickshire, Anne-Marie finally has some good news. In the last couple of weeks, I have had some success finding my ex-partner, so I can have papers served on him, which I couldn't before, so that's really, really positive. Anne-Marie can now apply for a divorce, but first, she wants to concentrate on ridding herself of the debts she says she was forced to take out by her Gambian husband. Hello, Anne-Marie. Hello, Paul. Paul Fisher has over 30 years' experience in the debt industry and hopes to help. So, Emery, what is it you want to try and to achieve now over the next two or three years? Where I want to go from here is I really want to... I'd like to get rid of these debts. I want to be, you know, in a place where, where I was before all of this, you know, mayhem started. As the loans were taken out in Anne-Marie's name, she is liable but Paul believes, due to her circumstances, the debts could still be written off. Certainly physical and or psychological coercion is duress. If it could be proved that you took out these loans under duress, the financial institutions involved, I think you would, you would find would be very supportive in writing off your debt. That's really, really, really good to know. Anne-Marie faces 17 years of paying back these loans and is therefore keen to get all the help she can. I think I can put my hands on enough evidence to prove that I was coerced into several of these loans and those loans caused me, you know, my, my finances to spiral out of control. I think that's really something that I, I want to look into. All right, our next comment is very funny. Put your hands together for Corinne Kay. Back in Washington, Corinne feels she's ready to move on. Her ex-husband is now back in Egypt, and she's thousands of dollars out of pocket. Has anybody ever embellished on a truth here before? But tonight, she's trying a new way to pay off her debts. Just anything to make yourself look better, you know, for those dating websites, you know, because I'm on one. I'm on one that says, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of them out there. I belong to the, I don't think I have enough time and I'm running out website. Taha has been sent the allegations made in this program, but hasn't responded. Corinne feels hopeful about the future. In the last several years, I've had a lot of difficulties thrown my way. But at my age, at 56, I have a lot of living to do. I'm going to be OK. In Istanbul, Tracy has already filed a case against her ex. But as he said he didn't have any money, her solicitor didn't take it any further. Hello. Hi. Three years on, Tracy feels differently, and local lawyer Sarah thinks she could file a criminal case. Uh, if you could go again to the prosecutor to file uh, a criminal case. Uh, I don't know the situation in Elazığ, but um, mm -hmm. go directly to, to a police station and give your statement. Mm -hmm. uh, explain uh, you have some evidences, including the, uh, the receipt of your transfer to his bank account. Yes. Can you, in a Turkish court, use text, Facebook, email, MSN messages, things like that. Can that be used in court? Yes. 
I've got even more evidence. In a criminal suit, you have more, uh, you have more power. It's a better option to file this criminal suit. Okay. Filing a new criminal case could mean Tracy gets her money back, but it could also cost thousands in legal fees. It's not a very cheap uh, process for Tracy to file a criminal lawsuit, but it's Tracy's decision to find out if this would be cost effective or not. People are probably saying, oh, why don't you let it go? This is principle. It's nothing to do with money. It's nothing to do with finances. This is actually principle. Anne-Marie also hopes that one day soon she'll become debt-free and move on with her life. I entered into my relationship completely besotted in love, you know, it was a dream. Um, but we live and learn and I would like to think that I'm coming out of the other end of it, you know, much stronger, much stronger. You know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Onwards and upwards from here on in. Omar admits he was in the UK illegally when they met, but says it was Anne-Marie's idea for them to get married in the Gambia. He denies ever coercing her into taking out loans. Omar admits their relationship was violent, but says he didn't whip her with a studded belt. He says he had to take a harassment order out against her after they split up. Omar also agrees he had a brief relationship with another girl, but says he had already separated from Anne-Marie at that point. He says she was also unfaithful during their marriage. Omar claims to have divorced Anne-Marie in the Gambia in 2012. In Yorkshire, all Elaine can do is reflect on her failed marriage to a Turkish man 20 years younger. She feels cheated. I regret this 110% what's happened to me and it's so easy to fall into it because I'm such a trustworthy, believing person. Um, and he caught me with my guard down at the time. And he come across as such a lovely person and that's what I needed in my life at the time. And obviously it was a big mistake. Adam says that he used to give Elaine between 100 and 250 pounds per week. And the money he gave to his brother was repaying a business loan. He gave his mother 500, not 5,000 pounds. Adam says married life had deteriorated over the years so he decided to leave at a time when Elaine was out of the house. Adam says he didn't regard Elaine's home as a B&B &B and didn't tell her he had been unable to be himself for the previous seven years. Tracy is at the end of her trip in Istanbul. She's determined to continue her legal battle to get back money from her ex. I think my personality has been changed by the Lent. Still, I'm very, very cautious, but I think there's no harm in being cautious. Bulent disputes Tracy's version of events, in particular that he has to pay Tracy back the money she gave him. He also said he tried to break up with Tracy many times, but she wouldn't let him. Bulent says he is now happily married and wishes to be left alone. <laughs> And Tracy is also in another relationship. I've met somebody new. Um, Aziz is totally different to Bulent. He can't do enough for me. He's absolutely besotted with me. He's never asked me for money. He's never asked me for anything. He's actually given me. And to say that he doesn't have a lot, he would give me his last penny. He would do anything for me. Hello, hello. Mm. Aziz is also Turkish, and talk of marriage is already on the cards. I like Tracy because she is so, for me, so honest, and she's a good woman. Uh, I will marry it, maybe. Tracy, if you want. We will see what, ha what happens. The next step is going out to meet his family in Malatya. Um, I'll take it from there. You live once and you take risks and I'm taking another risk on Aziz, but I'm going in with my eyes open this time. Every year, thousands of British women find themselves falling head over heels for a man they've met on holiday. 
I thought it was a very nice young man. He was very polite. He asked me for my mobile number and then he asked me for my address. Love struck and seduced, offers of marriage can swiftly follow. I think every girl's dream is to get married. And I don't know, I just felt special and wanted. And I said, yeah. But the course of love doesn't always run true. Passport scams and finance frauds are all too common. They must go to some sort of charm school. And like that holiday tan, the charm can quickly fade. If I knew that beforehand, I wouldn't have done it. I would not have come to Africa at all. Some brand new husbands just disappear. He received his British passport on the 5th of December and he was booking tickets for Egypt Air to get out of there, to go leave the UK. I come home from work and he wasn't here. Scammers use the promise of romance to get their hands on money and visas. My highest money, I've, I've taken $50,000. These are the stories of how Sunshine Romeos can turn into holiday love rats. Whether it's the sandy beaches or the heat of the sun, some single ladies on holiday can't help but fall in love. Diane Peebles was away in Sri Lanka when a young hotel worker and tuk-tuk driver called Priyanjana turned her head. I thought it was a very nice young man. He was very polite. He asked me for my mobile number and then he asked me for my address and I didn't think there was anything off it romantically or anything. Undeterred by the 33-year age gap and flattered by the young Sri Lankan's attention, when Diane got home to Edinburgh, things started to heat up. And after I got back home, he tried to call me, but his English wasn't that good. So then he wrote me a few letters. And then from January 2012, we were texting each other. We had a conversation on the phone and he mentioned marriage. And I was a bit taken aback. At the time, Diane was 54 and had never been married before. She was seduced by the dream of a new life in paradise with a much younger man. So seven months later, she flew back to Sri Lanka to see Priyanjana. Things quickly spiralled out of control. He was really excited. He kept saying, tomorrow engagement, tomorrow engagement. And I thought that we had to go to the uh, registrar's office because I was a foreigner. I thought that we had to register it you know, that we're getting engaged. But at the registrar's office, it became clear Priyanjana had a different plan. And then she started re reciting, do you take, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that's when I discovered what was happening. Diane was unwittingly taking part in her own wedding ceremony. I was kind of shocked at first, but he was urging me to, to go ahead and just say it. So we ended up, we got married. Didn't have an, a ring or anything, you know, which was very strange. This was not the wedding Diane had dreamed of for decades, so the couple dressed up for official photographs. And at the beginning, the new relationship went well. He was quite attentive and uh, quite romantic and very loving. I was developing feelings for him by this time. Diane wanted to build a new life with her husband, so she says she sent him £20,000 to start building a home in Sri Lanka for them both. This is where I used to live. A couple of years later, keen to help her young husband, Diane says she then sold her flat for £100,000, sending Priyanjana an additional £31,000. He used the money to upgrade his tuk-tuk to a minibus. Later, Diane decided to move to Sri Lanka to be with her new 21-year-old Sri Lankan husband. But instead of love blossoming, the romance withered. He spent more time at his mother's house than he spent with me. Or he would go out with his friends. And he would never come home at night time. So he was never there. And it just wasn't working out. We were just arguing all the time about money. Unable to return home, Diane started to realise this marriage may be a sham. And in 2016, four years after the wedding, Diane says she met another woman who claimed she was also married to Priyanjana. He denied it, but Diane says she saw a copy of a marriage certificate and even found Valentine's gifts. I felt betrayed because I thought he really loved me 
and that's why he married me. But obviously the marriage was never going to work because it was too big an age gap. His mother's four years younger than me, his father's two years older. My friends tried to tell me and I didn't listen to anyone. Diane's situation was about to get much worse. News of the money from the sale of her flat back in Scotland spread throughout the area. With active local crime gangs, the couple's relative wealth put them in danger. Tunisia. There's plenty here to attract thousands of British holidaymakers each year. But for single mum Sarah Phillips, it was a man working at her hotel that really caught her attention. Me and my son went to Tunisia in, I think it's the end of May 2015. And we started to go to the entertainment at night. And there was one guy that sort of kept looking at me and he was very good looking. This hotel entertainer called Haytham was quick to get Sarah's contact details. And even though Sarah flew home just a few days later, in the following weeks, he turned up the charm, sending messages asking her to be his wife. I think every girl's dream is to get married. And I don't know, I just felt special and wanted. And I said, yeah, all right, we'll get to know each other a bit more and get married next year or the year after. But Haytham wanted to be married much sooner. And he was like, no, I want to get married in November on my birthday. And I was like, why on your birthday? So, because it means it'll be a special day and I won't ever forget it. Seemingly undeterred by Haytham's rush, Sarah agreed and their whirlwind wedding went ahead. Saved every penny I could get just for the wedding. We got married on the 11th of November. The wedding was lovely. It was really nice. I got pampered for the day. Loads of people was there. Party was lovely. There was no reason for Sarah to think that Haytham was anything but the real deal. He always reassured me, always reassured me that he wasn't after me just for a visa and he said about me moving over to his country. Sadly, there was no chance Sarah could live in Tunisia as she needs regular treatment for kidney problems. It wasn't a choice because I need NHS care. So Haytham decided he would move to the UK but it was Sarah who would have to pay for the visa. This was a relationship that had already cost her thousands. I worked as much as I could, raising any sorts of funds. The wedding, the visa, flights, a round out total, about six grand. And being a single mum is a lot of money. Coming up, in Sri Lanka, Diane's story takes a sinister and terrifying turn. I was shocked and stunned. I didn't know what to think, because a lot of people were saying, oh, is he really dead? And a woman heads to Africa in pursuit of an online love match. What woman wouldn't want to come across the world to this? We all look forward to our holidays, a chance to relax and put our cares behind us. But letting our guard down can prove expensive. According to the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau, romance scam victims lose over £11,000 on average. Michelle from Norwich says she is still counting the cost after she was conned by a holiday love rat in Dubai. I went out there to help a friend of mine with a new business he was starting, which was a commercial diving business, and Waleed was a, a fellow employee. Waleed came across as a really charming, sort of really nice guy, you know, with a future, ambitious. He's a charmer. <laughs> I said to him, I said, To Michelle, Waleed was different to other men. Waleed had something which I, I hadn't had before, whereas they are more emotional. He would say, he loved you, he was a very passionate, I would even say, so that actually does reel you in. She fell in love, they got engaged, and she brought him to the UK on a fiancé visa. That meant she had just six months to marry, or he'd have to leave. During this time, Waleed wasn't allowed to work. If I wouldn't have married him on the fiancé visa, he would have had to go back to his own country. 
My preference would have been to wait longer, but I actually felt the immigration system itself was pressuring me to marry him. So the wedding went ahead at this registry office in Deerham. It was a perfect day. Michelle finally was the wife to the man of her dreams. I did love him. I thought the world of him. Yeah, I did. It was a chance of happiness. I felt that I'd found someone that shared my dreams. I can remember walking in here. I can remember my family sort of being here because that's just the memories, I suppose, coming back to me. Michelle says at first she supported Walid financially. She even paid for his diving qualification. She felt this was an investment into their future together. But Walid had other plans. As soon as his British passport arrived in the post, he was going to do a runner. He received his British passport on the 5th of December. By the 31st of December, he was booking tickets for Egypt Air to get out of there, to go leave the UK. So that was just that quick. So um, as soon as he got what he wanted, he was out. Walid had gone and Michel was heartbroken. To make things worse, he left a string of debts. Michel had visits from bailiffs. The couple divorced by 2012 and Walid went on to remarry and became a father. Then years later and out of the blue, Michelle received a bizarre text. I had a message saying that his daughter had been rushed into hospital and that she nearly died, but I found it all rather strange because um, if your daughter was ill, why would you be, uh, you know, WhatsApping your ex-wife who you haven't seen for nearly three years in the UK? Walid had plans and dropped a bombshell. He's told me that his um, Egyptian wife has died of cancer and basically would I look after his child. Michelle declined his request, eager to put Walid firmly in the past. Her own experience spurred her on to become a determined campaigner, trying to persuade the government to introduce new laws to protect women against marriage fraud. She set up the Stop UK Marriage Fraud Support Group and says she hears from thousands of women a year, often online. Quite often in these cases, there's a pattern of behaviour, you know, there's a psychological process. They actually groom us. The uh, men intimidate the women, don't they? Friends and family will be in on the scam. I don't think they have any guilt, do they? There's no guilt there. Romance, hasty marriage, demand for UK visas and passport, and finally, abandonment. My ex-husband used to call me the bank of Michelle. Michelle believes marriage fraudsters should be brought to justice. I set this campaign group up to help victims, and that basically saved me in a way. But not everyone is sympathetic when women find themselves abandoned. We've been ridiculed by the media saying, you know, you're stupid and how did you not know and that, but people don't understand what it's like until you've been through it. We were groomed. I know who the scammers are, how they're doing it, and I want to make the public aware of that. And we need the government on our side. Ghana, West Africa, a draw for tourists from around the world. 41-year-old Latoya Brown from Alabama in the United States first came here on holiday in 2011. She was enticed by a man who she met online, but also fell in love with Ghana. What woman wouldn't want to come across the world to this? This is beautiful. And when you put this on top of the foreign love affair, the allure of it all, and the chemistry comes together and it's perfect. So that's why women travel for love. Her story began back in the States. I was on Facebook like I always am, and I saw a message, and it was just simply, hello, how are you? And I actually ignored it. And then one day when I looked back at the message, it was this guy, and I was just like, oh my gosh, he's nice. The man from Ghana was called Emmanuel. According to Latoya, he claimed he was 32 and owned a big house. He told me that I was beautiful, and eventually that led to Skype conversations and uh, eventually visiting Ghana. I actually packed up for a three-week trip, and I mean, it was just a lot of fun. 
Emmanuel was every bit the perfect gentleman and pulled out all the stops to win Latoya's affections. One thing that would melt my heart with Emmanuel was every evening it was like a performance and he would extend his hand and say, will you accompany me? And I would always respond in kind with a yes, like this. And the formality of us dressing up to get to the beach always won my heart. I loved it. Emmanuel took Latoya to his home village of Kickham. He was keen to show her his house. Only when I arrived did I see the enormity of the house. This is the house. This is it. And I was just like, oh, wow. OK, this is even better than I thought. This used to be my view every day. Wake up and come outside here. Beautiful. This is like a five-bedroom house. Latoya was won over, convinced Emmanuel was a homeowner. During that time, that is when he suggested that we should get married. And of course, I played with that idea. Latoya went back to the States, but she was hooked. Within months, she'd returned to Ghana to marry Emmanuel. The wedding ceremony was huge. Dozens of guests from the village turned up. Latoya has come to see her friend Anne to reminisce about that special day. Looking back, there were definite signs that things in Ghana are sometimes done very differently than back home. About 200 people showed up. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like the whole, <laughs> yeah, that's the whole what it community. felt like. The whole community showed up. No one brought a gift. You're supposed to bring us gifts to make sure we're good as we're moving forward. And they left all of their trash in the yard. Oh. So we had to clean that up. Soon afterwards, cracks appeared in their relationship. I started to see the big cultural divide between Emmanuel and myself. Diane Peebles from Musselburgh near Edinburgh says she also felt from the moment she married that things were not right. Aged 54, she found herself in a relationship with a 21-year-old tuk-tuk driver called Priyam Jana. She sold her flat and moved to Sri Lanka to build a new life with her new husband. But the marriage was in difficulty when another woman claimed to also be his wife. Then her story took an even darker turn. No one knows exactly what happened, but Diane believes Priyanjana, now regarded as wealthy, faced demands for protection money from gangsters. First one of his friends was shot, then Priyanjana himself was murdered. I was shocked and stunned. I didn't know what to think, because a lot of people were saying, oh, is he really dead? Uh, he's maybe hiding, wait until you leave the country and then he's going to be with the other wife sort of thing. But he was dead, it, you know, he hadn't faked his death or anything like that. He was really dead. His body, I mean, it d didn't kind of look like him because I think they put too much embalming fluid in. So his body was all sort of swollen and puffed up. But it was definitely him. Diane is now back in the UK, but she's £100,000 out of pocket, with no flat and no job. Hi, Diane, are you right? Hi, I'm fine. Uh, I'm fine. Michelle, who runs the Stop UK Marriage Fraud Support Group, has come to Edinburgh to meet Diane. Michelle has met many women like Diane who have lost their life savings in foreign marriages. What about your family and friends? Were they concerned about how this guy was sort of rushing you forward in this relationship? Yeah, they, they were a bit concerned, but obviously I thought he was in love with me and I didn't listen to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know. What was the situation with his family after, after he was murdered? Well, after he was murdered, they were really nice to me and they said, oh, you can stay here for as long as you want. This is your home. We'll look after you, we'll take you shopping, we'll take you to the doctors, wherever you need to go, just let us know. This has been a terrifying ordeal for Diane. She was trapped in Sri Lanka. The minibus and home she paid for were in Priyanjana's name, so she couldn't get her money back. He treated you appallingly. He did. Yeah, he did, yeah. But he paid a heavy price for it, though, he to did. be fair. Yeah. He did, you know, because he's dead. So. That's true, yeah, six feet under, so... 
some people might say, oh, he got what he deserved because he wasn't very nice to me, he treated me very badly. Diane says even after Priyanjana's murder, his family wanted more of her money, but it was all gone. It took her two years to raise enough cash to buy a plane ticket home to Scotland. Diane had lost everything. When I told him I was leaving, his mother came over that morning, but he didn't want me to leave because yes. he wouldn't get any more money out of me. I well, that, they lost their cash cow now, because yeah. you can't them. I didn't have any money to give them anyway, so... Which yeah. they didn't, you shouldn't give them money They didn't anyway. understand. Now back in Scotland, Diane faces an uncertain future. Even before he died, it wasn't a great life. It wasn't the life I imagined I would have. But I wanted to live in paradise. I thought that's what was going to happen, but it didn't. I feel sad that I gave up my life. I feel it was just a waste and I shouldn't have given up my job and everything. And I really loved him and I thought he loved me, but he obviously didn't, so. Coming up, married life in Ghana, and Latoya discovers her new husband isn't the man of property she had thought. If I knew that beforehand, I wouldn't have done it. I would not have come to Africa at all. And in Sarah's rush to marry, she realizes too late that she may have made a terrible decision. I just wanted him to be out of my life. In paradise, it's easy to think life is always going to be sweet. Latoya fell in love with Ghana and a man called Emmanuel. She packed up her life in the USA to be with him, but before doing so, she made sure he had an income and a large property. I thought that I'd done my homework as I asked Emmanuel very pointedly over many discussions, what is it that you have? He told me I have a house near the beach and I own coconut farms. And I sold all my stuff in America and merged with him in Ghana in the hopes that we're growing together. Latoya was sure she had married her perfect match, romantically and economically. She believed he owned a five bedroom house, but after they married, a bombshell. Emmanuel didn't actually own the house. Emmanuel admitted that he was the one that helped build the house, but his sister is the one who owns the house. And his explanation trying to weasel out of that was that in Africa, when one person makes the house, it's their family house. And if I knew that beforehand, I wouldn't have done it. I would not have made such bold moves and I wouldn't have come to Africa at all. Things only got worse for Latoya, and the newlyweds started to argue. She says she also found messages to other women on his phone. That argument actually led to me cutting up all his clothes with a knife. And then he came up on me, of course, because he's upset about the clothes. But since I paid for them, I cut them all up. And he came up on me in a threatening way. So I turned around and I said, if you come closer, I'm going to cut you. So, of course, he heard that and he fled. So since then, I have not seen Emmanuel. Emmanuel denied he'd been messaging other women. They had argued over her cooking and whether to have a child. As their relationship fell apart, Latoya says message after message revealed his true priority, not their marriage or romance, but getting a visa. He simply just wanted to go to America. Latoya told him she was clear from the start she didn't want to go back to live in the States. He would say things like, OK, I'll consider coming back to you if you go to America and start applying for my paperwork. Latoya says Emmanuel repeatedly asked her to apply for a green card that would enable him to work in America. He would text, women who truly love their men, yes, help them get the rightful documents. Latoya flatly refused and said if they couldn't resolve the issue, they'd have to discuss separating permanently. He replied, if you refuse, then you are on your own. Sarah from Hearn Bay was on holiday in Tunisia when she met the man of her dreams, Haytham, who was part of the hotel entertainment team. 
After they married, she returned home, where she says she saved to pay for his visa to live in the UK. Because Sarah has health problems, they were able to fast-track his visa application from six months to two weeks, on the basis he'd be able to care for her. I think deep down I was hoping it was going to be rejected, even though it was money that I saved and worked so hard for. She was excited, but also wondered if she had moved too quickly from holiday romance to marriage. I didn't know whether I wanted to rush him over here, living in my house, in my space, when I've been single for so long. He'd come over on the 26th of March, and it was hard. I'm not going to lie, I had no money, so there was no way of feeding us. Things were so tough, they even had to rely on food banks until Sarah found Haytham some casual work. I managed to get him a labouring job and every time he come home he was moaning about his hand because he hurt his hand and that the work was too hard. But I said he only had to do it for a few weeks just to stabilise us. Married life with Haytham was far from the dream Sarah had hoped for and it wasn't long before the marriage hit crisis point. After... I think it's his third week of working. I come home from work and he wasn't here. Sarah had no idea where her new husband had gone, but his clothes were packed and it was obvious he was not coming back. I tried messaging him, I tried ringing him. I was getting no answer. Yeah, it wasn't until about six, seven o'clock that night that he said, I've gone. That's all I got was, I've gone. I went, gone where? He's like, I've left. You didn't listen to me. I told you my hand was bad. And I said, are you coming back? He's like, no, I'm not coming back. Sarah had no idea what to do for the best. I was kind of heartbroken and I was kind of relieved. It was a bit of a mixed emotion because I, I thought I loved him. At the time, Sarah turned to her friend Angie for support. She had been abandoned without money and was sure Haytham was with another woman just kept saying that it wasn't true, he wasn't in Scotland. He said he was in Leeds, he was in Newcastle. So every time the story changed? Every time. He didn't work and he just went off with another girl. To Scotland. Because he, he wasn't, he, he was he not interested in working. But that was not the end of the story no. by a long shot. Three months later, Sarah received a call from a girl in Scotland desperate for her to take Haytham back. All of a sudden, this girl rang me saying, oh, he wants to come home, he loves you. And I said, well, what makes you think I want him home? Well, I don't want him here no more. Sarah says the mystery girl revealed stories about Haytham she'd never heard before. I was like, you paid towards the wedding? She went, yeah, I gave £200 towards the wedding. And I said, why would you do that? Because he was a friend. And then she was like, oh, your, your engagement ring. She went, does it have loads of hearts around it? It was like a Pandora heart ring. And I was like, yeah. She went, oh, that's my ring. He wore that when I come over in October, just so he didn't have to go into the forces. So we were pretending we was married. I was like, what? I was, like, I was such an idiot. Sarah had had enough and wanted all traces of Haytham out of her life. After I found out that he was in Scotland with this other girl, I was pretty angry. So I decided to do a fire and burn everything of his. He's Clothes, my son helped throw some shoes on there. He's photos, wedding pictures, visa paperwork, and we just watched it go up in flames. Watching all the memories burn, it was amazing. And then he rang me actually halfway through and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm burning all your stuff. You with another girl, let's her buy you clothes. It was like a little revenge bonfire. And we just watched it till the flames went out and I didn't feel guilty whatsoever. I just wanted him to be out of my life. But that was not going to happen. Three months later, he turned up on her doorstep. He turned up back in my town on the day his visa was cancelled. Oh, very convenient. I managed to save his visa. And what were you thinking? I don't know. I don't, I really don't know. To be well, honest, you're still in love with him by then. I actually, I, mean, start, you felt responsible. I, I actually started moving on, but then yeah. I felt responsible. Of course. Um, and it's your husband, and you want to give it a go. Sarah felt duty bound to help Haytham, but in doing so, her life was about to become a lot more complicated.
Love rat stories are always fraught. Dee Aloan from Ashford in Kent first met her new man on holiday after her marriage broke down. I was really distraught. And my cousin Cynthia said, let's go on holiday to Tunisia just to have a break. The man was a student called Ahmed. He was absolutely devastatingly handsome, I must admit. He was very charming and he was tall as well. Dee returned to the UK and they stayed in touch. He did make me laugh. I found him quite funny at times. After several more holidays to visit him, in 2003, they married in Tunisia. This is us, the night of the party. The party was kept on the roof of a house. It's me and him. Look like sort of Beckham and Posh there. <laughs> I don't know. Joke. Joke. I thought these were happy days, happy times. Ahmed moved to the UK, but Dee wanted to spend time in Tunisia and bought a property there. Really, really nice house. And um, he'd actually taken a lot of stuff from the house in um, England to put in that house. In 2009, Ahmed set off in the car, apparently to take more belongings over to their house in Tunisia. This is the lay-by where Ahmed pulled into on the morning when he left to go to Tunisia. The car was laden and he couldn't go up the hill again. So he phoned me at home and asked me to um, bring his wedding ring. I came down here with the wedding ring to give to Ahmed, not knowing that Ahmed was going to use the ring for his marriage 11 days later to a Tunisian woman. Ahmed told Dee he had extended his stay in Tunisia, but then she was contacted by his cousin. I um, had uh, an email to ask me if I've divorced Ahmed. I said, no, what are you talking about? We're still living together. Ahmed had committed bigamy, a crime in the UK and in Tunisia. I found out that he had married a new wife. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. Dee sued him in Tunisia for falsifying the divorce papers, and he was sentenced to three years in jail. But by then, he'd fled to the UK. If he touches down in Tunisia, they will arrest him. But what will the British police do here? Because basically, I want the man arrested for the crimes he's committed. He's had the jail sentence hanging over him since 2014, but has never been arrested. Dee has continued to campaign for a change in the law and justice in her own case. Since 2015, I've um, continued to submit information, evidence, both here and from Tunisia, court cases. Nothing's happened. She asked the parliamentary ombudsman to intervene over the Home Office processing of her case. I was awarded £500 because they had sat on my case for six years and hadn't done anything while pretending that they were doing something. Protection in law has been something campaigners like Dee and Michelle have been demanding for years. As it stands, there is little victims can do if they feel they have been exploited by a holiday love rat. Thank you for coming today. Yeah, that's good. As far back as 2015, Michelle discovered how difficult it is to use the law once a love rat has obtained a UK visa. She consulted Paula Rona Adrian. Previously, the period of time to get a visa was two years in which the application could be made, and that's been extended to five years. There doesn't seem to be much focus on um, actually what happens after they mm. get British citizenship. You can be in a relationship with someone for years, and who's to say that if they do go before the courts, that they can't persuade the court that the relationship naturally came to an end? I actually went to my MP, who actually um, wrote to the Chief Constable. They sent two CID officers round. Um, they discussed what happened with me. Oh, Michelle, I know that this is frustrating, but you've got to advise all your followers that they should do the same. Because remember, indefinite leave to remain and citizenship can now be revoked. Coming up, Sarah's Tunisian husband is back in town and her life is about to get even more complicated. He'd come home after a few weeks and I fell pregnant. And in Ghana, Latoya confronts a real-life love rat. My highest money, I've, I've taken $50,000. Latoya 
Toya is separated from her husband and now supports victims of love rats through her website, and there are plenty. She still lives in Ghana, a country with its fair share of online love rats who target Western women. This 25-year-old is happy to reveal his methods, but not his identity. He claims to have lost count of how many women he scammed over the last five years. Yeah, this is somebody I'm talking to right at the moment. She wants to hear from me because she is very, very worried about me and she don't know what is going on, what is wrong with me, because I told her to send me money and she refused. So I decided to stop talking to her for a while. He never actually meets the women. It all happens online, where he hides behind another man's image. Here, this is the man I am using his picture for scamming. And in case the woman wants to see me on cam, this is the man you are going to see. So as we are talking, you see me typing and smiling, which will tell you I am real man to you. After I will tell you my microphone is not working. It's a tried and tested scam that works, and there's plenty who fall for it. My highest money I've I've taken or uh, took from women, say like fifty thousand dollars, and the rest um some might not have money, so you just consider, okay, you just help me with. $2,000 or 1,000 euros. This love rat has agreed to talk to Latoya. I, what I want to hear from him is, the, how does he feel morally or even ethically when he's doing these things to women? I mean, is it only this type of livelihood that you can find or is it something else? Are you chatting with someone now? No, right now I'm not oh. ch ch chatting okay. with anybody. Okay. So I heard about what, what you do, so I want to hear more from you. From, <laughs> so, like, for real, was it like a career choice between a doctor <laughs> or a scammer? <laughs> was it yeah. like that? It yeah. was like that, okay. Yeah. You were more concerned about getting the money? Yes, of that's course. the income of the job. These love rats often act alone, but some use a witch doctor or a so-called juju man to help cast spells over potential victims. Do you go to a juju man? I don't go to juju. I okay. Have, yeah, I have my personal pastor. I used to go to church. Okay, and you pray that yes. these people will come up off their money? Everybody, he or she has his or her business to do. No doubt. You always pray for God to give you more money. Is this Christian? Yeah. Okay, so you're praying that someone yes. will send you 50,000? <laughs> sure. And do you have family? Yes, I have a family. Okay, so how many children? One. Boy, girl? Girl. So how are you going to feel one day if she is scammed? If she's scammed? Yeah. It's, because, it's, it's all because of money and it is part of life. Sometimes I feel very bad talking to someone's mother. Ah, because I was going to ask you about your own mother. <laughs> So how does she feel? She said to tell me to put stop to the work I'm doing. And oh, okay. Yeah, she said, like, it's not good, so I should stop. Well, that's good. Thank you so much for bearing through all of my questions, even though some of them were very uh, invasive. Back in the UK, and Sarah's Tunisian husband, Haytham, returned home after running away to another woman in Scotland. Despite her misgivings, Sarah decided to give the marriage another go. We tried over the next few months, and then it came to May, he left again. And he'd come home after a few weeks, and I'd fell pregnant. Why on earth did you get pregnant? I didn't mean to get pregnant. Oh, uh, you didn't mean to get pregnant? No, I didn't. I was right. on protection. Right. It just okay. sort of happened. It, it happened. And then... She agreed to take him back. So me being me, I was like, oh, oh I'll give you this one last chance because I'm pregnant with your baby. He come back, he was lazy, still didn't do anything, still kept drinking every night. He stayed until I kicked him out. He also threatened me a week before I gave birth to my daughter, 
saying that I couldn't keep him away from his daughter, it's his daughter, he's going to take her and take her to his country and I would never see her again. After Sarah initially reported him, the Home Office revoked Haytham's leave to remain. But Haytham applied for a visa extension. He's still living in Hearn Bay. He has no contact with Sarah. Now he's gone, it's so much better. My little girl has just turned into a princess. Back in Africa, and Latoya has one more person to meet. In Ghana, some love rats are said to use what's called juju, an African form of witchcraft, in a bid to win over new single women. This is witch doctor Nana Before, who for a fee will cast a spell. I'll show you how you need to approach her, how you need to talk to her, how you need to, you need to coerce her mind into whatever situation you want to happen. Latoya's partner never used Juju, but she wants to find out firsthand how witchcraft is used to help love rats do the dirty. This person is okay with some a little evil for a little bit of money. So I want to understand how is it that someone can push some magic that makes someone's lives miserable. All right, so Nana Papua, any advice for ladies? Because I try to assist other ladies so that they don't get used. <clears throat> so, life is made up of choices. If he is able to put a spell on you, then you have laid that foundation for the spell to be active. Anything that somebody does to you, that can take an effect, is because you allowed it. Mm -hmm. You have to blame yourself first. One, and ask me why. Why do you say that? You had a choice. Right? To love him, or you had a choice not to love him. Right? You had a choice to inquire his background. You had a choice to really get to know him that much. You had a choice to trust him, and you chose to trust him. The best advice I can give to the ladies is that they should open their minds more. Right? They should open their mind and close their legs. <laughs> I'll let them know what you said. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is amazing to see that the deflection is basically it's the victim's fault, which is utterly ridiculous. We wanted to hear from the former partners of the women in this film. Haytham told us he'd done nothing wrong. And previously, he told a national newspaper that his relationship with Sarah was fine in Tunisia, but she stopped caring about him in the UK. She'd asked him to work while his hand was broken and only wanted him for his money. Walid did not respond to our letter. Michelle has not accepted his invitation to look after his daughter by another woman. I feel sorry for the little girl. I've got no sympathy for him whatsoever. He can um, rot in hell. Dee still hopes her bigamist husband will be deported to Tunisia to serve his three-year sentence. We wrote to all his previously known addresses, but did not receive a response. Latoya's partner, Emmanuel, did not reply when we contacted him. In email exchanges with Latoya from when they were married, he maintained that he had not been communicating with other women. For her, a happier ending. She's building a new life with a new love in Ghana.